podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, April 24th, 2022. This is episode 1,888. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Cashfly. Cashfly is giving away a complimentary, detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. See if you're overpaying 20% or more. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. Dot com. Well, hey, 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 it's Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yes, it's that time of the day where we talk about tech for the next three hours, obsessively, compulsively, without exception, technology. But that's a broad subject, right? That could be the Internet, could be computers, could be smartphones, smart watches, Facebook, Twitter, could be a lot of things, Tesla. In fact, our smart car guy, Sam Abul Samad's coming up in about 25 minutes. Uh, Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, a little later after that. And then our space guy, Rod Pyle. We got guys. <laughs> got all kinds of guys. Space guy, Rod Pyle, in hour number three. So, yes, all of that's tech, isn't it? These days, tech is everywhere. 8888-ASK-LEO if you want to talk about it with me. 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or uh, Canada. Uh, outside that area, you can still call, but you Skype out or something like that, and it should still be cost-free, 888-827-5536. Of course, there is a website. We, we modified it somewhat, moved uh, the Tech Guy Lab site over to the podcast site, twit.tv, as an economy measure. Well, it turned out the software we use, the what they call a CMS, Content Management System, we used for the Tech Guy Labs and for Twit, uh, Drupal is its name, D-R-U-P-A-L. Drupal, uh, we were on a pretty old version of Drupal, and Drupal says, we're not going to support that after next year. So I went to the folks, <laughs> I went to the Drupal shop, and I said, how much would it cost to update our Drupal on the Tech Guy Lab site? And they said, um, oh, just a quarter of a million dollars. And I said, oh, yikes. So we're going to update it on twit.tv because... Still need to update it, but uh, we're just going to move everything over there. So we'll have everything secure and safe for you, which is important, uh, and all the information you need. So there'll be links from the show. Anything I mentioned, we'll put a link in. It's not as sweet a you know, layout and all that, but all the same content is there. The links are there. In fact, there's new stuff. There's a transcript of every show with time codes, of course, audio and video from the show. So if you hear something, you should be able to find it. Even Professor Laura's musical playlist, uh, all of that will get there. Now, not immediately, though, so don't go there right now and say, where's her playlist? We're going to wait till the end of the show, and then she's going to put it together, and she's going to send it off, and then somebody from my team will go, okay, fine, and type it in, and then finally, a day later, it'll get in there. Be patient. Just like Elon Musk. Be <laughs> He's not the most patient, is he? Tweeted this morning something that the, everybody was in a tizzy over. Turns out was something else. He is, Elon is, so Elon, who, uh, of course, uh, made made his fortune off something called X.com, which then joined, merged with PayPal, made a lot more money, a few hundred million off of PayPal. He's what they call part of the PayPal mafia, the handful of people who made so much money on PayPal that they are now powerful oligarchs in their own right. Elon took some big chances. He, he he pushed all his chips in, put it all on red uh, by buying a, a little electric car company called Tesla. Put all his says he slept on the floor for for years or something. I don't know. It's it's, it's one of those stories that, that that gets more elaborate with time. I slept on the floor for three years to make that work. Um, the floor of the plant, not just on the floor of any old place, but in the, of the floor of the plant. He also doesn't have any houses, he says. Sold all his homes. So he's couch surfing. But if you're an oligarch, couch surfing is a little different for them than it might be for me. He's probably staying in one of his billionaire friend's extra houses, would be my guess. Would That'd be my guess. 
Uh, he also, of course, started SpaceX, which is really kind of a remarkable uh, story of commercial space success. He's announced plans to go to Mars. He wants to colonize Mars, even though that is going to be a challenge. Anyway, uh, the latest, and then he tweets a lot. <laughs> Mostly nonsense. <laughs> Mostly, in fact, in some cases, illegal nonsense, at least according to the Securities and Exchange Commission, which has fined him $20 million and said, you've got to have a lawyer look at your tweets before you post them, dude. <laughs> dude. That was the tweet where he said uh, he was going to take Tesla private funding secured even though it hadn't been uh and of course that made the tesla stock go up 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 and he reaped a fortune so much so by the way that he is now the richest man in the world with close to 270 billion dollars 270 billion dollars of a fortune so he spent a few billion about three to acquire a significant piece of twitter this is old news but i'm recapping so if you know you're, <laughs> you're just now getting into the story he bought about 15 percent of twitter which is enough to trigger actually anything more than i think five percent was supposed to trigger an sec filing which he did not do he waited weeks and the reason is you know he wanted to wait to he says well it's just a mix-up but there was a benefit to him because if nobody knows he's secretly buying up all these shares, the price doesn't go up. He can continue to buy at that low, low price. Then, of course, it did go up quite a bit, about 30%. Once it was announced, he owned all of that. What did I say, 15%? No, 9.2% is what he owns. Then they asked him to be on the board. Then he said, no, I don't want I said, yes. Then he said, no. <laughs> now, the latest is he has... Uh, he claims he has raised the money. He's got the bankers, Morgan Stanley and a few unnamed banks, like a dozen, to put up the money. Because even though he's the richest man in the world, and this is important, if you ever become the richest person in the world, you should know this. Even though he's the richest person in the world, it's not liquid. He doesn't have it in his pocket. It'd have to be a big pocket to hold $300 billion. So he uh, mostly it's in stock. It's tied up. And he doesn't want to just start dumping his Tesla stock because then the price would go down and he wouldn't be the richest man in the world anymore. So what people like him do, they don't, if you, they don't need money. What do they need money for? So he just borrows against the stock and plenty of bankers are willing to give him that. So he now has, Mr. Musk, he says he has, and I guess the banks agree, um, he has enough money to uh, buy Twitter. So we'll see. I don't. I still don't think he wants to. And actually, what I was started this all tirade on is this morning, about six hours ago, he tweeted cryptically, moving on, dot, dot, dot. And everybody thought, oh, he's moving on from the p purchase of Twitter, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> you got to remember... Elon is kind of like um, he's the trickster. He's Loki. He's he's uh, you know never you know always everything's going layers within layers. So then a couple hours after he tweets that he tweets from making fun of Bill Gates. He's moving on from making fun of Bill Gates. He posted with a profane tweet which I can't say on the radio a picture of Bill Gates who has a little bit of a tummy. Bill's sixty seven. He's got a little bit of a tummy. But he said it looks an awfully lot like the pregnant emoji, <laughs> the pregnant guy emoji, which it kind of does, blue shirt. So he, he made fun of him. And he's kind of mad at Bill Gates because Bill has been shorting Tesla. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on, and then dot, 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 and the rest of the sentence is, three hours later, from making fun of Gates for shorting Tesla while claiming to support climate change action. But it, you would be wrong. One would be wrong to read anything into elon's tweets they're they're designed to amuse and baffle so i'm not going to uh the stock market did read quite a bit into netflix's announcement netflix's the the announcement of netflix will solve that the announcement of netflix that uh they're uh for the first time ever subscriber base had dropped by a couple of hundred thousand people <gasps> stock market dropped by a couple of billion dollars 35%, I think, at the last count. I I haven't I don't have any Netflix stocks I haven't checked. But uh wow. Wow. Could it be the end of the line? And then and then CNN announced we're uh, we're dumping CNN plus after a month. 
launched last month after a month uh, because we only got 10,000 active viewers. And so, and of course, they just merged with another company, Warner Discovery, who didn't want them to do it, but couldn't tell them not to do it because they hadn't merged yet. So CNN went ahead oh, and do it. And then when they got the merger, they said, never mind and cancel it. So anyway, $300 million in marketing down the tubes. They were going to spend a billion. So I guess if you're a, a discovery, you say, well, look, we saved $700 million, which they need to because Warner, uh, the parent company of CNN and HBO, has $35 billion in debt. You see, again, <laughs> you and me, if, you know, if we had $30,000 in debt, we'd feel, we'd feel probably, you know, like pretty bad, right? Uh, $35 billion in debt, no big deal, no big, it's no big. Oligarchs, they're not like you and me. 8888-ASK- Leo. So the streaming, the streaming world is changing. That's, I guess, the, the bottom line. And Elon Musk is not. <laughs> eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. We'll go to your phones, your calls, right after this. Oh, they said the word telephone. That must mean it's time to say hi. Introduce my cohort in crime, Kim Schaffer, the hey unbreakable there, hi there, there. phone angel. Uh, hi there, hey there, hi there, ho hey there. there. I'm as happy as can be. <laughs> happy Sunday. Happy Sunday to you, too. Uh, you have a good week. Yeah. yeah I'm good. going to a Giants game for the first time in like <gasps> five years. Exciting. Wednesday. So I've got a little something going on exciting. this Exciting. <laughs> this week. Very exciting. I, butter and eggs. Oh my God. It was off the hook. <laughs> butter and eggs. That yesterday in beautiful downtown Petaluma was butter and eggs day. Yeah, there were so many people there. It was fun, huh? Yeah. I, I only went, the parade was already over, but just went and listened yeah, to the music. Yeah, I can't. Had a white claw. <laughs> What's a white... Oh, no, never mind. I don't even want to know. It's something you young people drink. Is it an adult beverage? Yeah. yeah. It was fun, huh? Yeah. Once yeah. a it year. It was nice to see people out doing things. Yeah. Because that's it was almost, foreign. It was almost like COVID didn't ever exist. No, I mean, it, just, it didn't there. It did not there. It's really interesting. There were maybe three people wearing a mask. Yeah. One of them was Micah. Oh, was it? Yeah. I like said, oh, that. bless his heart. Bless his heart. Bless his heart. Who should I talk to Let's here? talk to um, Alan Upland because he's asking about a jet pack and that's something completely <laughs> different in my mind oh, that I'm sure he's asking about. I want so a jet pack. I, I need to be educated on, as to, aside from the Rocketeer, what the jet pack is. He's probably, well, I hope it's a real jet pack, not the like WordPress the plugin, but we'll find out. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Alan from Upland. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, I have to push this button. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. I'm a long-time CTE uh, engineer and, and just uh, know enough about technology to be dangerous. But uh, My kind of guy, I'm using, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using a jetpack. I think that's what they call them from Verizon to support oh, my internet. To that's Okay, so I had uh, speculated that you weren't talking about the jetpack, which they exist now. You could put it on your back and fly around. You were talking about jetpack, which is a WordPress plugin. But no, you're talking about the Verizon jetpack. Right. Which is a kind of a MiFi device that lets you use the cell phone network for your internet access. Yes. And um, we're in a mobile home park, and I can only get, uh, I can either get the dish type stuff, uh, which is not acceptable, or I can get uh, the DSL from uh, from Verizon, or well, actually from Frontier, and that's uh, you. But you move around, right? You're not stuck in one spot. Well, that is true, but but even for my home, um, the Verizon or the, the excuse me, the Frontier stuff is uh, it's DSL and it's limited to about right. Six, so Verizon yeah, has so two solutions for you. The Jetpack is for your RVing because just like your phone, it's a hotspot that goes around right. with you, and as long as you've got. Verizon, high-speed Verizon Internet, LTE, or better, it's going to be pretty good. Uh, it allows you to hook up 15 other things, so it uses Wi-Fi. It should be fast enough. It, the problem with uh, cell phone data is it's not consistent. It depends on how many people are using that tower at any given time, your distance from the tower, and things like that. So 
you can't, unlike a landline DSL or a cable connection, you can't say, well, you're going to get 100 megabits. So they don't. But it is often 50 to 100 megabits, which is certainly fast enough to watch TV. You, exactly. th they want to discourage you from using it at home. They really want it to be a mobile thing. Because then if you're at home, you're sitting on a mobile tower the whole time. Uh, but they do sell now something for your home, which is actually, uh, if you got, especially if you've got Verizon's uh, 5G in your neck of the woods, is actually a very good choice, I think. A good alternative, better than DSL, as fast as cable. So if where you live, you have... Um, good connectivity to Verizon and I guess if, if you know if you, if you don't have a Verizon phone get a friend with a Verizon I have, phone I have LTE I, I, the best I can get where I live is LTE okay that's so but they are rapidly rolling out this what they call mid-band so, so 5G when they first started hyping it especially Verizon was especially guilty of this they were hyping something called millimeter wave which you have to be 800 feet from the tower, and there's very few towers. In fact, they talk about how it's available in NFL stadiums. Yeah, if you're at the right end of the stadium. It doesn't even go mm -hmm. across the stadium. So, so that is kind of, I, you know, many, many phones will use that. I wouldn't worry about that unless you know you live in an, an urban area, you know, like New York City or, uh, the, you know, three blocks area of, of Philadelphia where they have it. I wouldn't worry about that. There's the low band, which is no faster than LTE. And and Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile all offer low band. But then there's this mid band, which is... Verizon, it's very confusing. Verizon calls it ultra wide band, but it's actually the mid band. But you'll see UW on your phone. And that can be up to 500 megabits. That can be really fast. So this this these Verizon home internet systems support... UW. Uh, they start at 25 bucks a month. You're probably going to pay 40 for what you want, which is not bad for f up to 500 megabits per second. But up to is the important word because it's going to depend. In, in your case, maybe not because you can't get, uh, you don't get UW. But they are rolling that out very quickly. So the time will come probably where UW will be available. Might be. Yeah, if I'm getting to the jetpack that I have. I'm getting, uh, like I say, we have the best we get here is LTE. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, uh, oh, usually somewhere between 20, 25. Yeah. Um, That's kind of okay. Really for, yeah, it's good for what I. For it's what not I, good for watching high, high def, yeah. you know, Netflix. Uh, uh, well, we, we use it on the TV, and I don't, we don't watch a lot of. Uh, high depth necessarily okay. only because my eyes are not that great yeah. anyway. So, so if you don't care, care yeah. Now they don't want you to yeah. use that at home. They don't want you to be in the same well I guess you could. I don't know. The, the bandwidth limits I think are what makes that less desirable. Yeah. But uh, they do have a home internet version of that. So if you're getting a su sufficient speed on the jetpack at home, you should probably look at their home internet solution. Okay, I'll look at that. Now, Hold on just a sec. Got to take a break. Sam Abul Samet, our car guy, coming up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <clears throat> Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. The only uh, the only issue I have with this thing is that it doesn't have a uh, a a port for um, for uh, Ethernet. No, it won't. And, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a Wi-Fi access point. Yeah. Right, I want to uh, I want to be able to put a network drive on this thing, and I don't know if that's possible. No, not not on the uh, jetpack. Um, okay. What you could do though is you could get a network attached storage device that has Wi-Fi built in. It's not ideal at twenty five megabits per second, but you but but you know it runs in the background at night. Really, what you want to look at though before you start doing stuff like that is what the limits are, the bandwidth caps on that okay. jetpack, because you'll hit that pretty darn quick if you're doing it for backup and stuff. I mean, really, they intend that for light internet usage, maybe you know, looking at Google Maps as you drive, getting your email, that kind of thing. Uh, even yeah. if you watched a lot of Netflix, you'd start, to, you'd start to hit those caps pretty quickly. Yeah. Suppose, well, you know, it's, it's unlimited, but who knows what that means. Um, well, read the fine print because uh, unlimited usually actually they've gotten in trouble. So maybe it is unlimited now. But what it used to mean is unlimited, but it slows down a lot after 
10 gigabytes or 5 gigabytes or whatever. So see where they say, see where they say after, you know, after you use 25 gigabytes, you're going to slow down to 3G speed. See where they say that in the fine print. Yeah. They may not because they got in trouble for that. Now, the other device you were talking about, the one that uh, uh, that they're coming out with now, would that have the capability of putting a network drive on it? Uh, I'm looking to see if they have an Ethernet port on that, because wouldn't that be cool? My guess is no, but uh, it's called their 5G Home or 5G Home Plus. And I have not used, well, I've seen them, but I never thought to look and see if there's an Ethernet. <laughs> Let me see, 5G Home Plus Ethernet. Let me see if I can find a picture of it. Um, yeah, I don't, they don't mention Ethernet, so I'm thinking they're, oh, wait a minute. Yes. Yes, I'm seeing at VZW.com three LAN ports. Oh, well, wait a minute. This is the 5G home router user guy. This might be for their fiber. You know, call them. Call them. Okay. Because this looks different. This says the home router. Yeah, it looks like they, it, but it looks different than the one I've seen. So, uh, but it looks like at least one of the devices they offer has uh, a WAN port. Oh, this is just a router. I don't think this is their this is their home. Oh, I get it. Maybe this is for connecting. This is a router to connect to the home internet. I don't know. They sell a router. It looks like it's just a router they sell. Okay. And that would have to have LAN ports. Um, here it is. There's a Verizon Internet Gateway router. Yeah. Now, that's a router again. Gosh darn it. Does anybody have Verizon home internet? Looks like it does have a LAN port. But it, you, before you buy it, call Verizon. And then also get the deets on limits and so forth. Yeah, that gives me a, a path to go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for calling. Well, thank you for all that you're doing. It keeps, keeps us old guys up to date and everything. <laughs> My pleasure, Al. As a fellow old guy. <laughs> Take care. Bye -bye. <laughs> it does have ports. Okay. Okay. I want to get one for my daughter because she's got an ultra wideband in her apartment. And I thought instead of Comcast, it might be more affordable to get that. Tech Guy Show brought to you today and always <laughs> by Cashfly. Cashfly brings you all of our content. If you go to the website and download it, if you download it in a podcast application, you're downloading from our content delivery network, Cashfly. Why do we use a CDN? Well, <laughs> for lots of reasons. It's lots less expensive than just down hosting it on our own website, downloading it there. That can really add up. By the way, it's also a lot more reliable and a lot faster. A CDN, content delivery network, like Cashfly, puts you closer to the content. So Cashfly, because it is a, the best CDN is going to be as much as 10 times faster than downloading it from a website. They have pots, pops, points of presence on six continents. So our listeners are getting it not from the, our server here in Petaluma. They're getting it from a server next door to them. So that's much faster. Plus, because they have so many points of presence, they have extreme reliability. Even if a server, one of their servers goes down, they have failover. The other servers are still going. 30% faster than other CDNs even. Cashfly is pretty amazing. And how do I know it? We've been using it practically since the podcast network started, more than 10 years. Now Cashfly offers low latency, ultra low latency video streaming with latency less than a second. And it can run more than a million viewers concurrently. What? You'll go live in hours, not days, with sub one second latency. Ditch your unreliable WebRTC solution for Cashfly's WebSocket live video workflow. It scales to millions of users. This is an amazing thing. 50 plus locations around the globe means you'll reach your audiences no matter where they are. You'll be closer to your customers. You'll take a load off your origin servers if you use Cashfly storage optimization system. We've been using this for a long time now. It's available to everyone. 
essentially cash fly hosts the content so you reduce your s3 bills you increase your cash hit ratio to 100 percent. it's actually brilliant and man is the support great i highly recommend signing up for that priority support you will get amazing support 24 7 every day of the year from the nicest engineers who in many cases are already on it <laughs> if there's an issue they're already on it they're just amazing Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill. Just bring your usage trends, your bill if you have it, to twit.cashfly.com. See if you're overpaying by 20% or more. Get the best for less. Cashfly. 100% availability in the past 12 months. 100%. Not four nines, five nines, six nines, ten nines. 100%. We love Cashfly. I've never had a problem with them in all these years. They're the best. Twit. Dot cashfly.com. Take my word for it. We're very happy customers. Now back to the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, tech guy time, and it's time to talk automotive tech with Sam Abul Samet. He's a principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. He hosts the Wheel Bearings podcast, joins us every week. Hello, Sam. Hello, Leo. How are you? I'm well. Do you think as a automotive journalist you need to live in michigan is that part of the deal not necessarily uh there's lots of them that live in a lot of different places a bunch of them in los angeles i know several that live in portland oregon uh oh, strangely interesting. enough um interesting. my one of my one of my co <coughs> excuse me one of my co-hosts on the wheel bearings lives in new hampshire the other one lives in uh the the bay area so you can so live anywhere we're everywhere but yeah. i think you have a as long you as have, you have a road you have an inside track Living in Ypsilanti. I mean, you're just down the road a piece. It, it does make it easier for me to attend briefings yeah. with uh, manufacturers and suppliers yeah. and so on. Um, but, you know, when it comes to a lot of the drive events and, and various other events that we go to, a lot of those are in other locations anyway. And so we ended up getting flown there. Like, for example, this past week, um, I flew out to L.A. for about oh, eight, 18, 19 hours, I think. Um, to see the car that's uh, behind me if you're watching the, the video stream. What uh, is that? That looks like a, uh, well, I see the Lincoln Mark on the front that, of it. This is the Lincoln Star concept. Um, so Okay, well, wait a minute. As soon as I hear concept, I tune out because well, it doesn't mean they're going to ever in, ship in the, that. In the, past, in the past, that has often been the case. Um, you know, in this particular example, you know, the, the challenge as manufacturers go to electrification is, you know, you don't need that big grill with all the airflow for it you know, right. to cool the engine because you don't have an engine to cool. You only need a, a relatively small opening to cool the so battery. So Teslas have a, you know, metal front. They don't have any grill. Well, actually, it's plastic, but... Plastic-ish. Yeah. Metal-looking <laughs> yeah. plastic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, so the the question is, you know, how do you, from a design perspective, how do you give a car a distinct visual appearance that's, you know, implies, you know, this is what the, you know, the, you can, you rec you see it and you recognize the brand. Yeah. You know, for example, you see a BMW, you see the twin kidney grill, you know, that's a BMW. Right. You see a Rolls Royce, you got that Parthenon grill. You can't miss You that. know, it's a Rolls Royce. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, Lincoln, you know, their current batch of vehicles have a, you know, they have a unique, uniquely shaped grill and, and headlights that you see across the board on all of their vehicles. And you see that, and you know, it's a modern Lincoln. Um, but it's been a challenge for some brands to figure out how to evolve into the era of electrification. BMW so far has basically just kept, actually, as they've grown their twin kidney grill from, you know, relatively modest size to something that is massive and over <laughs> I think it's unattractive, but car. I think luxury cars, they, is, they, they, they all have big grills. There must be a reason, like... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's been a general trend in the industry over the last uh, just, seven or eight years. Lexus is, does it, too. Let's make it bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, is know, that so what that, BMW's done is, is so they, that, just, they it, just blank it off. It's like a pedestrian catcher, so it just like... It, it, I don't know. No, you know it's, 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 a, it's more aesthetics than anything else, you know, yeah. just trying to create well, that brand image. It's, that's right. You know when you see that BMW grill, you know that's a BMW. There's just no question. Right. Those kidneys coming at you, coming at yep. your kidneys, that's a BMW <laughs> grill. 
We know that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So what what this vehicle is uh, is this is a preview of the new design direction for Lincoln as they start to launch their their electric vehicles in the next couple of years. And so it's got I a spent, grill, but it's uh, it's a pretty grill. Well, it's yeah. It, well, it's not. It's not. You know that face. If you're looking at it, and I'll drop a link to uh, to my article about this uh, in the chat. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're looking at it, you know what would what you would normally think of as the grill um, is not. Is, there's no actual grill opening there. That is, uh, it, it's a panel, but it's backlit, uh, and the 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 paint the color on the backside is etched away and uh it's backlit with leds and they can do animations and create different lighting patterns on there and lincoln is, or cadillac is doing something similar with the new lyric as well mm-hmm. um but then what really kind of sets this one apart is the this light bar that stretches across the entire front uh, front leading edge of the hood and then stretches up back and over the wheel arches. Uh, and it's, it's quite a distinctive look, and, and I think it's really attractive. Um, so you're, we're not going to see this exact vehicle, but the vehicles that we're going to see are going to have you know, most of the characteristics, the visual characteristics of this vehicle. So this is the face of electric Lincolns to come. Yeah. It looks good, actually. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of electric other... vehicles have that light bar across the front. That's yeah. like Lucid does that too, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. And and then there's some other unique features about this this concept that may or may not make it to production. Like a lot of EVs have a front trunk or a frunk. Um, what Lincoln has done with this one is they've gone a little bit different. So the what you would normally think of as the hood, you know, that normally is hinged at the back and flips up to give you access to the frunk, that panel now actually just lifts straight up in the air and then um, there's essentially a drawer for the front that that opens that extends out from the front of the car oh. to give you easy access oh that's kind of cool like a lift gate on a pickup kind of yeah and so I don't expect this particular feature to show up on all of the Lincolns um, you know this in the case of this particular vehicle you know it's not as tall as, as normal as most traditional SUVs uh, so it doesn't really need it because it's not that high. But um, on the electric version of the Navigator, which is their big full-size SUV, this would be really beneficial to give you easier access to get stuff out of there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting approach. The other thing that's cool, the, the hood panel, um, such as it is, is actually a piece of electrochro- electrochromic glass. So I don't know if you've ever been on a Boeing 787, but the windows on there, they don't have traditional mechanical shades. They're, uh, they're coated with an electrochromic material that when you run an electric current through it, it, gets o- it goes opaque. It's so cool and yet so strange, but yeah, I like and it. So yeah. if, if for some inexplicable reason you wanted to show the world what you're storing in your frunk, um, you can make it transparent so that everybody oh, can see what's in there. And then you can also make it opaque. Um, again, that's one I don't think will make it to production, but you know, a lot of other aspects of this vehicle will. And then um, finally, there's the interior uh, where they have what they're calling a coast-to-coast display that stretches all the way from one A pillar to the other, all the way across the top of the dashboard. And this is a concept that we first saw several years ago at CES with a company called Byton, an e- uh, a Chinese EV startup that may or may not ever make it into production. Um, but uh, this is, uh, I think we, I think we may have talked about this once before. Um, I, I got a chance to ride in a Byton uh, prototype a couple of years ago in San Jose, and basically you've got the panel, uh, the display panel that stretches all the way across, and it's up at the base of the windshield, so it's almost like a heads-up display. It's closer to your line of sight when you're driving. You have a more expansive view of things like maps and so on. Um, And this is something that will be coming to market. In fact, um, Lincoln just uh, in the last month or so launched a model in China uh, for for only for the Chinese market, a sedan called the Zephyr. Um, And because we don't buy sedans in America anymore, um, they, they launched it for the Chinese market. And it has one of these displays that stretches all the way across. Uh, and this is something that we will be seeing on these upcoming Lincolns. So there's stuff that that won't uh, won't quite make it to the real world, and some other uh, re- other really interesting stuff that probably will. A concept car with some pretty cool concepts that mm-hmm. maybe <laughs> they'll release. Yeah. Uh, 
What about that steering wheel? I'm I, that looks a little too much like a yoke to me. Uh, um, yeah, it's maybe they you know, won't it's do kind that. Of slightly squared off. Um, that's actually pretty similar in shape to the steering wheel that's in the new Corvette. Uh, yeah. So that's you know that's not not quite as okay. bad as a yoke. Okay. Uh, but uh, next next week I'll talk about a yoke that uh, that it, will be available. It's no yoke, but <laughs> it is a concept car. So yeah, your mileage, the Lincoln Star vary. concept. Thank you, Sam Abul Samad, Principal Researcher, Guidehouse Insights. His podcast is at wheelbearings.media. Have a wonderful uh, day and week. I will see you next week. It's 80 degrees out, sun shining, so I'm going to go drove my Miata yesterday and drive some more. Spring in Ypsilanti. People are worried about the uh, sun hitting that uh, display. Actually, I kind of understand. Yeah, you know, it depends on it depends on the display technology that's used. Um, you know, even with the current smaller displays that we have in vehicles today, uh, you know, some of them do better than others. Uh, the ones that um, that Hyundai and Kia and Genesis use are excellent. You know, even with the sun shining directly on them, they're still very visible. Yeah. Um, and you know, others like. Uh, some of the ones that uh, Nissan and Toyota have used in, in recent years uh, are just un, unusable right. in bright sunlight. Right. So it depends on the specific display technology you use, but you it can you can do it so that it's still very visible. Cool. I am going to give you your three and a half minutes. Alrighty. And I shall return. Okay. So uh, let's see. Somebody here in the chat was asking about. Uh, uh, yokes, uh, uh, yeah. So um, Lexus this week um, announced their RZ450, which is their first EV. It's based on the same platform as the Toyota BZ4X and the Subaru Solterra that we talked about last week. Um, and one of the options that they will be offering in there is a yoke style steering wheel. Uh, now. This is very different from what Tesla is doing with the the model the Model S Plaid. Um, in the Model S Plaid, they've kept a traditional mechanical steering system. So, between that yoke and the wheels, there is a steering column that goes down to the the steering rack, and you know there's a mechanical connection between your hands and turning the wheels. Um, the same is not true for the RZ if you get the optional uh, yoke. The yoke only comes as part of what they're calling a steer-by-wire package. So in the, in the Model S, if you have to do a, a tight turn uh, at, or do you know, some counter-steering, if you, know, if you start sliding, things like that, uh, and you have to do your traditional hand-over-hand -hand steering, it's really difficult, almost impossible to do reliably with that yoke steering wheel. Um, and you know, if you've ever watched um, a Formula One race or, or a lot of other races, you'll you'll notice that a lot of modern race cars do have a yoke style steering wheel, but they also have what you know what we know is a really fast steering ratio. Um, so it takes very little steering angle to actually turn the wheels. That's not practical in a road car uh, because that would be way too sensitive for most driving conditions. But in a race car, you can get away with that. Um, what they've done in the Lexus is they've taken the steering column out and you've got a steer by wire system. So essentially the yoke is like a video game controller. Uh, you turn it and then that signal gets interpreted by the computer along with a whole bunch of other signals like how fast are you driving, what are the conditions you're driving in, um, and then it decides how far to turn the wheels based on that. Uh, so in the case of the uh, most vehicles, the to go completely from one end to, of the steering to the other, it's usually somewhere around three to three and a half turns from lock to lock from one, one extreme to the other. So about, uh, about 1,000 degrees roughly of rotation. In this Lexus, it's a maximum of 150 degrees of rotation. So you're never going to go, you know, you're never, you're never even going to go ni full 90 degree rotation in either di direction or the other. So you can use the yoke um, and keep your hands on the wheel all, uh, or on the yoke at all times and never have to switch back and forth because of the way it's set up. So it, it remains to be seen how well that will actually work and what that's going to feel like. But, um, you know, at least they're going in the right direction. I still prefer to have a traditional round steering wheel and mechanical steering. Um, you know, as, as an engineer that's worked on this stuff, certain things I think should probably remain relatively analog, but that's just me. 
Is this our tribute to our caller from Winslow, Arizona from last night? <laughs> I think it is. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere outside the U.S. or Canada. If you want to talk high tech, let's do it. Not just problem solving. We can talk about, you know, t concepts, ideas, but mostly it's problem solving. Shane is on the line from Indianapolis. Hi, Shane. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm great. Welcome. I'm back. You're back, baby. <laughs> okay. Now what's okay. The, now what's the problem? <laughs> it's this Twitch thing. It's it's a Twitch. That's yeah. what it is. So you want, you want to stream to Twitch. Right. But what I want to do is I want to, I have a PC set up for my DAW and I want to use the audio. I want to go out. DAW audio. is not his dog or his parent. It is his digital audio workstation, just so we yeah. know. Okay. Yeah. So you've got your computer with a DAW. So that's yep. where the audio is. Yep. And I have another gaming system that I want to stream or make that music pipe through to that stream and, so, and use an audio there. When last we joined Shane, he was attempting <laughs> to, <laughs> to stream. Uh, as I remember, you were using uh, oh, some strange, it was a very Rube Goldberg system, right? And we uh, wanted to simplify uh, it. Have we simplified it now? Yeah, well, I figured out what the problem was. Oh, good. So I, have a, I have a really nice mixer. It's a Yamaha... Trying to think. Is it an analog or a digital mixer? It is digital. Okay. It's got a, it's got so it's a got USB thing. out of it, and so your microphone goes into it. Uh, mm -hmm. So does your computer with the doll. Go, right. Goes into the it, and it mixes that down, and then outputs that via USB to the streaming machine. Well, can't that's the that's the hard part. How do I get the doll? machine to stream to to connect to the other machine it, can i just use a usb i have not oh that's right. interesting well it's going to depend on your doll <laughs> i like saying okay. that i like saying that <laughs> most, <laughs> uh, most reaper, so it, 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 almost certainly it will do it because that's how pros want to do it they don't want to output audio analog audio from a computer and record it or do anything with it. They want bits coming out of the computer, which mm -hmm. they can then pipe into something else, whether it's a digital to analog converter uh, or or another device, like in, as in your case. So, yeah, the DAW should have, the. You may have to um, I, Mac I or PC. Mac should, Mac or PC. You see, I do have a Mac, and I have. So I don't. Then, with a Mac, you, know. you can say there's, and I think this is the same with a sound control panel on a PC, you say what the output is. So go into your sound mm -hmm. control panel, and you're, if, if you have uh, a device, that Yamaha mixer that has USB in, it's important, it has USB in. If it is taking USB in, then you will just select that in your sound control panel. You'll, you should see it. It should say Yamaha, do, Yamaha mixer. Okay. Well, and that goes... that. And that will go into the mixer. So the, well, the trick is your your mixer has to have both USB in and out. Okay. Does that make sense? I haven't I haven't seen one. If it does not, if it has only analog in, which would be weird, uh, microphones are analog, instruments are analog, uh, yeah. then you can take the you can either take the analog audio out of the computer with the DAW. Or you can have a if buy a separate standalone DAC, which is what most pros would do, because the DAC in in most PCs isn't very good. So you want to get a good quality DAC that can do 24 bit sound, you know, and take that out of the PC via the USB port. You'll select that DAC from again the sound control panel, mm -hmm. and uh, then that will output analog into your mixer. If your mixer, I'm sure your mixer has some sort of digital I think it like I can set it up like it's the same USB port and I can set it up so that the mixer has uh, it's you, so it only has it only has one USB port it only has one USB okay port. look and see if there's optical in then that would even be better okay see if it has a, one of those weird optical connectors on the uh, back. I may end up just getting some new hardware then a fully digital look a digital mixer should take digital in and out I mean okay. that's you know that's just so if your Yamaha outputs USB, 
Unless it's mm -hmm. right, kind of low end and it's designed just for somebody who says, "Well, I'm going to play a guitar and sing, and so I want my microphone and, my, and a micro and a pickup for my guitar to go into this mixer, mix that, and then send to my computer." You know, if it's an inexpensive mixer, it might do that. So I, I just it depends on what the Yamaha is capable of. Get that get that I, get that manual out and look through it. Look through it. Yeah. Okay. And I looked at it some time ago because what I was thinking is, well, all the research I found was just go out your audio port on your one PC and then oh, you can do that. Your mixer. Yeah. And then that would record it. But it's a real. I mean, it's it's a not a good sound. <laughs> yeah. So there's the, part of the problem the is the yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, part of the problem is that you if you put a digital to analog converter, something has to do that. The computer is thinking in bits. It doesn't know about analog. Mm -hmm. So somewhere along the line, those bits get to be turned into analog sound. It, but the, if you do it inside the computer with a sound, that's what sound cards used to do. You know, you remember, you remember your sound blaster oh, from yeah. Creative Labs. Old sound blaster. Yeah. With the with two so they, discs that went with it and yeah. all that good stuff. So that was a DAC. It went into, you know, you plugged it into the slot of your computer, and it took the bits from your computer, and it had jacks on the back you could plug into speakers or whatever. But the problem is if you're doing it inside the computer, it's a noisy environment. And generally speaking, computers which do have DACs, otherwise they wouldn't have analog outputs, you know, for your speakers, they're not going to spend a lot of money on that particular part. Because they figure if you care, you'll have your own DAC. Right. So you could so there's a couple of things you could do and DACs can be under 100 bucks it doesn't have to be hugely expensive. So you could get a DAC that plugs into the computer's the DAW computer's USB port. Select that as the output for your DAW and then uh, that will have an analog output which you could then put in the Yamaha if the Yamaha doesn't have digital in. Okay. 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 We're going to put a link uh, setting up your Twitch stream. Somebody put, found a good article <laughs> that awesome. covers some of these topics. What is it you want to stream again? I forgot. Uh, so what I've done is uh, uh, <laughs> I've kind of taken some metal guitar riffs and I put that over some techno music. Oh, that's or whatever. Right. You're playing along so the music. I, Got it. Yeah. And are you playing an actual yeah. guitar? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the yeah, Yamaha uh, is there for t to take your guitar, if you have a mic, your mic, to take, right. if you're take you know, the original music. Oh, is the original music being played off the DAW? Is that why you have the DAW? Yeah, that's why I have the DAW. Got it. So and you then, could, I, if you wanted to, I mean... I'm trying to save my gaming p PC for just the right, gaming stuff, right? right? Like, call, call me nuts, but you could also just get, a, you know, a, a music player and plug that into the Yamaha. I do. <laughs> as well that's working okay yeah it's that just, would be easier yeah when i when i use like ableton or I use yeah. reaper yeah that you know you can compose it there sure but i don't want to put all that software and all those all those files on my gaming system i want to keep them kind of well i have to say it's much less of a rube goldberg situation than it was so you're getting there we're getting there well that was uh <laughs> that was i was trying to use something um uh, you were using the Zoom. The you were using the Zoom right. to pick up the yeah, and that was that yeah. So so we so we yeah. we flattened that stuff out a little bit. Yeah. That was a, a driver issue. Actually, I had to go to uh, Yamaha and get the drivers from oh, okay. Steinberg. Yeah, Steinberg. Yeah, they make Cubase. Is that your DAW? Which DAW are you using? You said Ableton. Uh, I'm using Ableton and using Reaper. Okay. Reaper's anyway, a kind of open source. Yeah, I like uh, Reaper. Reaper's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I bet you there is an, a, some sort of digital input into that Yamaha. Look for um, a, a Toslink connector, an optical connector. That would be great. Of course, your computer may not have an optical output, so. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my DAC, right? <laughs> then you need a DAC. Oh, my God. No, you don't need a DAC because the optical is digital. So you, need a, you just need a, something. I don't know what you need. Okay. It's complicated. Around, <laughs> That's, that doesn't me on the right path. Shane, I can't wait to hear this YouTube channel. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> Crazy. Sounds like fun. All right, Sam, you're going to have a mind-boggling nine minutes and f something, 15 seconds. All right. Mark. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> All right. Thanks. If you need me, just holler. I'll be sitting here drinking my coffee. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Willie Stroker asked uh, whether BMW has lost their way with the bold new designs. Are they trying to be too ultra modern with the new kidney grill? Losing sales to Tesla may be the cause. 
you know, it's it's hard to say. I I was talking with some folks from BMW last week at a brief preview briefing of the new 7 series. Um they unveiled Was that the, the car that you were saying you couldn't talk about last week? Uh yes. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. So the, oh, the new boy. 7 series sedan which includes uh the i7 an electric version. Yep. That looks really um, sweet. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not crazy about the design, you know. I think compared to what BM or what Mercedes did with the EQS, you know, it's Aside from the front end, it it's pretty conventional looking. You know, it's a pretty standard, you know, traditional three box sedan. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my 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 big issue with BMW is that you know they have decided that they're not yet ready to go all in on EV, um, and so at the, up to this point, they haven't done a, except for the i three, they haven't done a fully um, you know battery electric purpose-built platform uh, that's coming in 2025 with what they call the Noya class the new class car um, but right now the i4 the ix the um, the i7 these are all based on um, they've done flexible versions of their platforms um, so they can use the same architecture for either internal combustion hybrid or battery electric versions and that is an inherently compromised process. You look at any of those vehicles in profile, you notice they have, you know, the traditional BMW profile, the long hood, you know, which looks more premium, more more sporting, you know, and the cabin is kind of set back a little bit. And you look at that and you think, oh, there should be lots of space in there for some front storage. And then you realize, no, they haven't bothered with any of that. Um, there is no <laughs> front storage. I mean, you look at your, your, your Mach-E, you know, and it's got a nice, decent size storage compartment in the front. Um, you know, BMW claims they need all that space for all the climate control stuff and, and everything else. Well, it's like on their internal combustion versions of the same car, they still have the same climate control equipment. And yet, you know, they also managed to fit in an engine in there. So if you take out the engine, there should be some space left. And so, you know, it's kind of a a weird argument to be making. Um, and especially the, the seven series, you know, it's a big car yeah. and there's, there's no front storage. Yeah. That's and weird. then another, yeah. another example of where they compromised because it's got the same floor pan for all the variants. There's still a center transmission tunnel. So in the back seat, if you happen to be sitting in the middle, there's a, there's a tunnel there just like there is in the gas engine version of the seven series except there's no, nothing in it there's no transmission or drive shaft or anything else so it, it is kind of compromised in that way and I, I think until BMW you know does a more mainstream purpose-built EV which is coming as I said is coming in 2025 you know I, I have a harder time recommending it and you know the the seven the i7 uh, compared to the Mercedes EQS, the EQS has an EPA rated range of almost 370 miles. Uh, I think Tesla I really Model want S an EQS miles. 580. I think is I'm just so beautiful. Yeah, it's so nice inside. And you know they haven't. They don't have. I don't think they have a front trunk in the the EQS. But it also has a much shorter hood front end. Right. Slopes down. You know, it's a sleeker look. Um, and yeah, so it's, I think Mercedes, you know, I mean, they, they're still not quite where Tesla is, you know, in terms of their energy efficiency or Lucid, but, um, you know, th they've definitely gone in the right direction with this generation of EVs. And I think BMW needs to, to step up. And granted, BMW doesn't think that, you know, the EV sales are going to be, you know, are not, they're not going to hit the same kind of market share that some of their competitors think are going to be there. If they're right, then maybe they made the right decision now and not necessarily investing so much in dedicated platforms. But if they're wrong, then they could be left in the dust. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a tough thing. I mean, when you're, when you're investing, you know, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars in a vehicle program, it's always tough to make those decisions. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it plays out over the next several years. Uh, one of the other questions uh, that uh, somebody had uh, earlier on in the chat while we we're talking was about whether it's worthwhile to buy a plug-in hybrid. Um, and it depends a lot on what your use case is. Uh, so 
just to clarify, you know, a hybrid it has an internal combustion engine, an electric motor, and a small battery, and it uses uh, the motor to provide some uh, propulsion assist and also to do regenerative braking uh, to recover energy when the vehicle's slowing down, put that back in the battery, which it then turns around and uses when you accelerate so the engine doesn't have to work as hard. You get better fuel efficiency. Plug-in hybrid, same basic concept, except you take a much a significantly larger battery. Uh, and, you know, this week, my review, first drive review of the Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe came out, which is an example of a plug-in hybrid. Um, so you now have enough to, uh, battery to do some significant amount of all-electric driving, like an EV. Uh, and you still have, uh, when the battery runs out, then you still have a, a standard hybrid powertrain, so you still have a more efficient uh, partially internal combustion powertrain. So when you want to take a road trip, you don't have to worry about planning where you're going to stop to charge and leaving time for charging and all of that. You dr just drive it like a traditional vehicle. And then finally, um, battery electric, you know, which eliminates the internal combustion entirely. But now you have to plan on, you know, where you're going to find chargers and, and leave time for charging. So um, most people like 80% of all driving in the U.S. Uh, is less than less than 40 miles a day. So for most people, you don't need an EV that gets three, four, 500 miles of range. Uh, and most, the vast majority of people do not take, you know, cross-country road trips on any kind of regular basis. Uh, but for those that do, you know, the, the EV is great um, you know, certainly great for, you know, everybody's daily commuting. Um, longer range EVs can be very useful for road trips. Uh, but as I said, it does take a little more planning. Um, hybrids are very fuel efficient and um, are also great for, for longer trips. And then the plug-in hybrid kind of tries to give you the best of both worlds. So um, most modern plug-in hybrids, get uh, anywhere from 25 to 30, in some cases as much as 40 miles on a charge, which is enough to do all of your daily commuting on electricity alone. You plug it in at night, um, and if you live somewhere where you have access to charging, if you have off-street parking in a garage and you can charge it overnight, then you can do all your daily driving. Um, and then um, uh, and, uh, when the battery runs out, you just keep on driving. You don't have to stop and find a charger every time your battery is depleted. Uh, and so for the long road trip, you know, a, a, I think a great example of a great plug-in hybrid is the Chrysler Pacifica uh, plug-in hybrid. 33 miles of electric range. You can do. You can drop the kids off at school, go to work, do, do all your, your normal driving without using any gas at all. And then when it comes to time for a road trip to Disney or to go visit the grandparents or wherever you're going to go, you just keep on driving. You don't have to do any plan. You don't have to do the kind of planning you do with a, a battery EV. So um, it's it depends a lot on your use case. Um, you know, if if you if you don't take long road trips and your your daily driving can fit within the range of what's available in an EV that's in the kind of vehicle that you want, go with an EV. If um, if you don't have access to charging at all, go with a hybrid. And so then if you're I'm going to go with a Lucid Air because it's got 500 miles. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey, um, if I were going to wanted to get a Lucid Air mm -hmm. in February 2024, I I don't need to order it now or reserve it now, right? Or do you know? Um. I'll have to check. I, Would I you find out if I wanted it. to get one in Valentine's Day uh, in two yeah, I'll years? See how much, I'll see how much, ba how much of a backlog they have. I think that's going to be the one, comparing that to the Mercedes. I think that's going to be the one. Um, yeah, we're, we're, my wife and I are planning a vacation, uh, probably driving up the West Coast uh, this summer. And I'm actually going to try and see if I can get a Lucid oh, Air. We good. want to drive from, from San Francisco to Portland. That's what to I want to hear. Kid. I want to hear your, yeah. your reaction. Thank you, Sam. Have a great All week. All right. I'll talk to you next week. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the EE -E Tech Guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada outside that area. You can still reach me, but you're going to have to use Skype out or something like that. 8888 Ask Leo, uh, the phone number. 
uh, website, techguylabs.com. You can go there and get the latest uh, from the show, all the links, video and audio of the show after the fact, uh, even a transcript of everything I said and you said, techguylabs.com, and that's free. Back to the phones we go. Let's go to Hatfield, PA. Jerry's on the line. Hi, Jerry. Hello, Leo. This is Jerry from Hatfield, Montgomery County, PA, the less affluent neighbor to the Bucks County one, which you alluded to yesterday. <laughs> now, was that rude of me to start talking like that? Because I have the impression Bucks <laughs> County is kind of the upscale neighborhood. Do you know what I'm saying? It is. Their taxes are crazy. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't. I, I didn't want to be mean. Uh, I, I have family from Bucks County. I, I know. I know the truth. I know the truth. Montgomery County, it's just a little more down to earth. That's right. Yes. Well, Leo, my community yesterday had Earth Day, and I took some electronic stuff in the, for recycling. Oh, nice. Which really, which I hated because I, I got rid of a, a large uh, all-in-one all laser printer Oh. because they don't make the toner anymore, unless I want to spend eighty dollars a cartridge from Indonesia, oh. and two H uh, HP printers which don't work with uh, Windows Ten. Oh, I don't you hate this? At yeah, least you did the right fine. thing, yeah. and you and you brought it to the electronics recycling. Right. So well, one hopes it's not going to get yeah. put in a pile and burned. Yeah. So Leo, I'm thinking if I move to Lenox, what guarantees or what? How how do I know if I go to Linux, I can get a printer that's going to work right on Linux and I don't have to change the operating system? Well, interestingly, you could have checked to see if any of those, well, the, the toner cartridge is another matter, but those HPs, right. you could have checked to see if they'd work with Linux. So, in general, the way Linux works, Linux, I should say, is a open source, which means you can look at how it's done, free operating system created by a community of volunteers for the most part who uh, put in their time to make uh, a, an operating system to compete with Windows and Mac. And as you know, I love Linux. I'm a big fan and I use it uh, as my day-to-day -day operating system. Um, almost in every respect, it, 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 this is starting to change. It used to be for a long time that the companies that made the hardware barely knew Linux existed. And the last thing they were going to do for a tiny, tiny market share is write custom drivers. So they would make drivers for Windows, for sure, because that's not, you know, in those days, 90% of the market. Maybe, not always, maybe they'd make drivers for Mac, because that was, at the time, 3 or 4% of the market. But there was no way they were going to make drivers for Linux, which is, you know, one-tenth of 1% 1 of the market. It just was too much time and money for such a small market. So what happened it, over the decades that Linux has been around, it's been around since 92, over the last 30 years, is the volunteers who write Linux would write their own drivers. And they would write drivers for the hardware that they had, which tended, for the most part, to be older hardware. So, and this is still somewhat true even today, that the older hardware, like your old printers, is very likely to be supported with open source third-party drivers. Not from HP, but from uh, some volunteer who's got an HP printer and said, well, I'm going to make this work. Now, that's changing. Companies are recognizing Linux. Linux is much more than one-tenth of one percent of the market now. It's really growing. It's, I think, two or three percent of the market and growing. Uh, and companies also realize it's very good PR to have drivers for Linux. So more and more you're seeing that. But generally, the advantage of this is, you know, HP discontinued their drivers for Windows 10, right, for those printers. That's correct. Now, is that because it's not in the printer? No, they could write it. They No, they want you to buy a new printer. Uh, I tossed them out. They could, so there's no technol as far as I know, there's no technological reason, and I'm pretty darn sure of this, that they couldn't make a driver to work with that printer. The only reason is economic. They don't they want you to get a new printer. Well, you've had that printer for ten years. What what do you expect us to do? Live on sandwiches? You need to buy a new printer. Don't forget the ink. <laughs> oh, and don't forget the ink. So it is very likely. So the the, the Linux printing system is called CUPS, C-U-P-S, not the song, 
by by Pitch Perfect, the, the drivers for printers, and there is a long list of cups supported printers. Cups C U P S dot org. Okay. Ironically, Cups was originally designed by Mac, by Apple, but it is an open source standard. And what what you'll have is if there is a guy out there who has your printer, who says, "Darn it, I want it to continue working. I'm not going to rely on HP. We can't even rely on them to give us a Windows 10 driver. So I'm going to write my own driver for, and put it up for Cups." Uh, but good news, these Cups drivers work fine. HP uses, uh, and I'm not sure about the vintage of your printer, but they used to use, and I think they still do, a printer language called PCL. So the other thing you might look on CUPS, if it doesn't have that model, is for a generic PCL driver. Is there any version of Linux you would recommend? I've never used it before. I do have a copy of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is what most people it. start with. But, but you want to download the latest. They're free. Um, uh -huh. This is a larger discussion. Uh, I am a fan of a distribution called Manjaro, M-A-N-J-A-R-O. These are all free, and you know what? You can try them. If you've got an old PC lying around, just download these. And you, you what you do is you install them on a USB thumb drive, and then you put the thumb drive in. You tell the computer, boot to the thumb drive, not to your internal drive. And the whole Linux will run, and you can try it. And you can make. In fact, I recommend to do this. Make sure that your everything you want, you know, works. The sound buttons on your keyboard, the trackpad, or the mouse, that kind of thing. And if everything works, then there's an install button, and you can install it right onto the hard drive. Do this with an old computer that you've got lying around. Uh, uh, they're in the trash too. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but that's what. See, but Linux aficionados. A lot of them want to make sure those older things continue to work. They don't have the same economic incentive that HP, Microsoft, Dell have to get you, you know, obsolescence. They want to keep this stuff. Yeah, yeah, they want to keep this stuff running. So uh, Ubuntu uh, current version is twenty two oh four, which just came out. So uh, you will April twenty twenty two, right? So you probably will want to download the newest one. Uh, another good one based on Ubuntu that's good for beginners is Pop OS. That's from a company that makes Linux hardware, System76. Uh, they make a very nice kind of cleaned up version of Ubuntu. There are two kind of families of Linux. There's the slow and stable family, and there's the what they call the rolling release family, which is the most, we want to keep it most up to date, but we're willing to take a little bit of a chance by doing that. Um, I'm in that second group. I use a rolling release based on Arch. It's called Manjaro. Debian is the slow but steady, st slow and stable version. Debian is the precursor. Ubuntu is based on Debian. Pop! OS is based on Ubuntu. You'll see this all the time. But Ubuntu is fully community. It's a really, uh, uh, I think, a very good choice. Nothing wrong with Ubuntu. Before you let me go, Leo, give me a wave goodbye. Are you watching? Well, of course. I watch. Yeah. Okay, so about 20 seconds from now, you'll see me saying, so long, Jerry. <laughs> eight seconds. <laughs> oh, good. Eight seconds. That's not much latency. That's great. There you go. Jerry, and Here you see, if you are watching, I have, and thanks to Micah Sargent who made this for me, crocheted it for me, a little Linux mascot, Tux the Penguin, and he's got a cute little hat that says, I love Linux, because Micah knows that's where my heart is. Pleasure talking to you, Jerry. Give my regards to all the nice people in Montgomery County. Okay, okay. Now stay away from those Bucks County folks. They're, they're just too snooty for words. 8888, ask Leo the phone number, 888-827-5536. No, 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 I have family in Bucks County. We're good people, too. There's good people everywhere. You know, that's the truth of it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls to come. Yes. Nerdle. N-E-R-D-L-E. -E. <gasps> All right, I'm going to play it. The Daily... No oh, it's a numbers wordle. Guess the Nerdle in six tries. All of these are kind of based on Mastermind, huh? Yeah, yeah. So each guess is... A oh, it's a formula. It's a calculation with plus, minus, times, divided... Or Though they should have... You know, bit shifting. They should have more stuff. Yeah. Well, we need always need more parentheses. 
Okay. I think I could probably solve this. Let's see. So what do you enter first? Just a bunch of numbers? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. So, so, okay. John has already solved this. Let me show it here. Guess the nerdle in six tries after each guess the color of the tiles, blah, blah, blah. Each guess is a calculation. You have to have at least one equals sign. It can only have a number to the right of the equals, not another calculation. Standard. And, of course, I presume the calculations always have to be correct. Yes? Does not compute. Okay. Well, so you ideally you'd want to get all of the numbers in there, right? Right. But you want to get, yeah, one, let's see. One. It's not taking, oh, you have to do it from the keyboard. One, two, three, times four, five. Oh, that's not going to fit. No. So one, two, times three, four equals, is that still too big? Yeah, it's going to be three digits. Oh, yeah, there might be a plus in there, huh? One, two, plus three, four. Oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, equals 56. Right, well, let's not get it wrong. Thank you, John, for your math. 46. Okay. Okay. And then enter. So what is the what does the move mean? Is that wrong? wrong position so the equals sign they're not even there so now we got to do three five six oh yeah i did six. Oh, hold on <laughs> i got a darn radio show to do Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number if you want to call in with a question, a comment, a suggestion. Glenn's on the line from Tampa. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you so much for calling. What's up? I've got a Surface Pro 3. That uh, problem just came up. We've had it, um, and everything's been fine on it. Yeah. But um, I think it did an update on uh, Windows 10, and the mouse keeps bouncing to the right and uh, off of whatever I'm clicking on, and a screen pops up um, when I'm not doing anything. <laughs> and I've done a bunch of troubleshooting up till this point, so I'll... I'll that's well, the first happen. thing, of course, and you've done this, I'm sure, is try another mouse. Yes, I did. Okay. So you have some other mouse, you plug it into the USB port. Is it the trackpad that's doing this? Do you have the keyboard, or is it just the mouse? Um, both of them do it. I okay. disabled the, the pad. So that's one thing I would do is disconnect the keyboard so that you don't have that extra stuff. And then just connect right. connect the mouse via the USB port, and it's still happening. Correct. Okay, so it's software, obviously, right? Uh, or it could be, uh, no, it couldn't be. It could. I was going to say a bad mouse port, but it happens with just the attached keyboard. So... That seems unlikely, although they may both be on the same USB chip. I'm not sure how the connector works on the Surface Pro. For people who don't know, Surface uh, Pros are tablets, but they have a detachable kind of fabric keyboard, uh, and you can use that, and it has a trackpad, so you can use that as a mouse as well. All right, so it sounds more like it's a mouse issue, and this happened after a recent update? I believe that's when it started happening. Yeah. So, the problem is there isn't a distinct mouse driver. The mouse is something called a human interface device. So, the driver is an HID driver. And probably so generic, it's unlikely to have problems. But, you know, anytime you have a hardware failure or, or misbehaving hardware with Windows, you, the first thing to do is to remove the driver and reinstall it. And I mean really remove it. So, I guess you could go into your device manager. You know how to do that? Yes, I've gone in there and I found the mouse and I've deleted 
There was three Good. of them in there. I deleted all of them. And there, oh, that's interesting. There were three different mice drivers, huh? Yes. Uh, all under USB? Yes, all MIDs. Oh, interesting. MID, huh? M-I-D-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. I would think that's mouse interface driver, so maybe that's something Microsoft uh, does. All right. So you deleted them all. Now, sometimes, by the way, uh, deleting a driver requires more than just finding it in the device manager and you know deleting it. You want to delete all the files. You actually have to go to the driver and find the files. There'll be DLLs and weird named files and delete those specifically. So maybe that's it. But you did all that. It plug and played new drivers and it's still happening. Yeah. And so it happens with the trackpad, which is the Microsoft version, and it happens with a Microsoft mouse and other mice or Yes, I tried two different <clears throat> all right. mice. I got a uh, wireless, so I tried two of those and I've got a yeah. Good. I mean you've done all the right troubleshooting. You've eliminated, I think the issue of it being a mouse problem um, uh, or even maybe a USB problem, you, which is good because you don't want it to be a hardware problem. You want it to be a software problem. I'm trying to think. So it jumps around on its own even when you're not touching it. Right. And if I go in a box and say I want to type something, I get like one letter and it's off the box. <laughs> It has a life of its own. But even with your hands away, you're seeing mouse movement? Yes. <clears throat> I have no idea. Um, I mean, there's always the nuclear option, which I hate to recommend, but I tell you what, if you call Microsoft, they're going to say to do this first. Every tech support company does this, which is to reinstall Windows. And the reason they do that is we don't know. They don't know what you've installed. Maybe you have some weird device driver or little widget installed that's uh, a mouse jiggler for instance that's very popular now by the way when people are working from home and the boss is checking to see if they're actually working they'll run software or hardware that jiggles the mouse moves the mouse around from time to time to make it look like they're doing something um there is so jojo dancer has a download for a universal driver uh, at support.microsoft.com. And JoJo in our chat room is saying maybe if you download that, uh, it will it will take over. It's certainly worth trying. See, the, the thing that they're going to tell you to do that uh, you know, I, I'm trying not to tell you to do is back up all your personal data uh, onto an external drive and then uh, re do the reset, the Windows reset, which re really basically re restores it. You did that? Yeah. I've done that already. You did it. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. So that means, so even with a kind of basically, as it came from the factory version of the software, you did the complete reset. You didn't save data or anything. It's just a complete reset. You Correct. You're still getting that. Yep. Now it does sound like it might, in fact, I'm sorry to say, be a USB problem, like a bad USB chip, and that's expensive to fix. I'm trying to think of what we could do short of getting bringing it bringing it in uh now, wow if i'm if I'm using a docking station a different u s b port does that make a difference on the chip? Try that does it still do it yeah, yes, oh my goodness um no, because the docking station is plugged into that u s b port right you only have one u s one port on that thing am I right? Yeah, but when you dock it, it, it... Oh, the dock, that's right. It goes to the Microsoft connector. That's right, the Surface connector. That's right. Okay, so you're connecting the Surface connector and it's still failing. I still think it could be... <clears throat> most computers have one or two USB chips on the computer. Two if they're fancy. Probably on that computer, one. It's a fancy computer, but it only has one port, so it does, probably doesn't need more than one. Um, if that chip goes bad... This would match the symptoms. One, um, I mean, that could happen, I guess. One other thing you can try. We're going to put a link in the show notes <clears throat> to the, um, the the generic driver you could download and try. One other thing you could try. It's kind of another nuclear option, but download a copy of Linux. Linux doesn't work well with the Surface Pros, but what we want to do is at least 
boot to an external operating system. So what what would be good is to download a copy of Linux, put it on a thumb drive, put it in that USB port, tell the Surface boot to that. In order to do so, you might have to turn off secure boot. But the only reason to do that is to see if the mouse behaves the same. If it does with completely different operating system, it's definitely a hardware problem, most likely the USB chip. So that's one way to one way to test it is is not use Windows at all. Other than that, you got me. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <clears throat> so uh PC Guys, how to geek says you should install the optional driver updates. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It might be worth a try. So you know when you go to Windows Update, it does the critical updates. But then there is optional updates. There's a button or a drop down that says optional updates. And you can see other updates, which are usually driver updates. Okay. Have you tried that yet? No. Uh, yeah, you could. You're not gonna. You're not gonna go wrong. So go to Windows Update and then View Optional Updates, and see if there is a MID or a mouse driver update. Uh, you know, optional update there. I actually, I always install the optional updates. Mm. Um, you know, advice varies. This How to Geek article I think says not to. Uh, only install them if you have a good reason. I always install all optional updates, including driver updates. Um, there are Intel updates often. There might be uh, you know, a real tech update. I think your mouse drivers are real tech. Yeah. Is it a real tech? Do, mm. do you know, or is it a Synaptics? It might be Synaptics. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's um, the mouse I'm using is a Logic Tech. Okay, and that's the other thing. If you're using a Logitech, get the Logitech driver off of there. Mm. At least, again, this is all diagnostic. Yeah. But if you uninstall the Logitech driver, make sure that's not conflicting with the Windows driver. Okay. Got it. I'll try those. There's a whole, yeah, a few more troubleshooting things. And then it's and then unfortunately, uh, you know, it's a trip to Microsoft. They're gonna they're gonna make you do what you already did. So you did the hard thing already, which is reinstall Windows. Great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry I don't have much better help than that. Thanks, Leo. All you right, Glenn. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye bye. bye. It's either a one-digit answer or a three-digit answer, right? Yeah, so I'm going to say three, five, let's see, we've done six, seven, minus, because we haven't, we don't have an operator yet. Well, I'm going to, I'm trying to get a one-digit answer. <laughs> so it's going to have to be like three, five, five, oh no, yeah, I'm going to run out, yeah. So, I am out of spaces. Dang, this is a little ch more challenging, isn't it? Three, five. I did time. Did I do times? No, I didn't. Okay. Three, five times seven equals 210 plus 35, 245, right? Oh, but we know we don't have a two. And we don't have a four. So, yeah, but but I could do something. Well, all right, let's do it. Let's just see. Okay. Enter. That's a lot of clues. So the five is in the correct position. And equals wrong, so equals probably here. Yeah. So equals probably there. And we know that we have three, five, and seven, and times. Oh, that's interesting. Can you have times and divide? Can you have two operators or just one? No, but I could have multiple operators in the solution. This is fun. I'm going to play more of this one. This is good. No, you're supposed to do standard op uh, operating order of operations. 
It is a happy day. Happy days to you, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. By the way, you don't have to just call with questions. If you thought maybe you had an idea for our, uh, for our mouse guy... <laughs> for instance, uh, that would be a good reason to call, too. We're all in this together. We're all helping each other out together. 8888-ASK-LEO. Don's on the line from Carson, California. Hi, Don. Hello there, Leo. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm a long-time listener. I've been listening to you since the uh, Windows 98. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking the other day, because I was talking with, um, with Paul... And uh, we did Windows Weekly. We started doing it just before Windows Vista came out. So that was Windows XP we started with. Windows 98, why, you must go back to tech TV days. Oh, even before that. I, I, oh, yeah, I was doing the radio in San Francisco before that. Were you in San Francisco? No, just down here in L.A. L.A., when did I start? I didn't start in L.A. until 2004. But, okay. uh, but oh, no, but then John C. Dvorak and I did have a syndicated show you might have heard in the early 90s. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Windows 98. Wow. John and I started doing that show when it was Windows 3.0. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. DOS, good. Remember good. DOS? DOS 6, man, yeah. that was the best DOS ever. So <laughs> I was like, I still got that computer here. You do? Wow. Yeah. You're not putting it on the I Internet or anything, I hope. No, I'm using it to program radios. Oh, very cool. Are you ham? Yes, I am. Oh, nice. So you're I'm using software-defined radios. Oh, of course. I've been That's using nice. uh, I've been ham radio since what? Well, since high school. Fun. It's changed, hasn't it? It used to be a lot of analog oh, devices. Yeah. Now it's all digital, software-defined radios. So really, I you know, I have my very nice ICOM uh, tran transceiver. And uh, I, I wanted to add capabilities. They said, "Okay, fine," and they installed software. <laughs> it's all software. It's yeah, just a right. it's just a computer <laughs> that looks like a radio. Yeah, ever since the internet came out, it took a lot of the attendance as far as ham radio people yeah. went away. Yeah, but at least you don't have to know Morse code. I bet you do, though, don't you? Yes, I do. Oh, impressive! That's impressive. I love it. <laughs> I love Morse code. So, what can I do to help you? Okay, currently I have, <clears throat> excuse me, currently I have a Macintosh, I have a Windows uh, Windows 7, I have a Windows XP, and I also have another Windows DOS, which is MS-DOS 3. Holy cow, and 3? You have 3.2? Wow. No, not yet. Not yet, oh yeah, yeah, don't upgrade too soon. Gotta wait and make sure they get all the bugs out. <laughs> That's <laughs> <not> a statement. <laughs> you never know, right? I would guess really? DOS three probably now is probably got you know most of the bugs are patched. I would guess pretty reliable. Uh, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me talk to you about my current problem, which yes. is Windows XP. All right, another another blast from the past. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but you know, if you're using it to program radios, that's fine, right? In fact, probably a lot of the software you use hasn't been updated since then. Uh, you know, I'd be nervous about putting an old, unsupported version of Windows on the Internet because uh, of Beastie's, you know, malware. But other than that, it's perfectly fine to do do programming radios, for instance. Yeah, I use Windows XP, for, believe it or not, for the Internet. That I'd be a little nervous about because you're not getting the latest security patches. I know. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, I'm using the way called antivirus software, which has helped me a lot. Okay, but again, uh, uh, you, you know, for instance, the browsers no longer update for XP, uh, okay. which which means you could have vulnerabilities in the browsers. Antiviruses are slowly falling off one by one, but at least they see there's a market with XP users. But an antivirus alone is not enough to protect you from some of the malware that's out there that is active. Tell me about it. That is active. Yeah, you've already been bit. Yep. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. Because every time I go to ex execute what you call an internet browser, which is no matter which one I have on here, it automatically shows the, it says your clock is ahead. I can't figure out why. <laughs> your clock is not ahead, I take it. It is April 24th on your clock? Yes. Okay. And it is 1237 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So your clock's not ahead. So the browser's no. broken. But you have to know that no, none of the major browser manufacturers 
support XP. So you have to be using an out-of-date browser. Are you using Internet Explorer? Uh, I tried that. So same problem. Huh. And you're sure that you have your clock is accurate because that's one thing that happens with older computers. The battery that's backing up that time dies, so sometimes those have to be replaced. Uh -huh. So it is possible. Make sure you're not back in 19. Uh, what was it? 1904. Really? I think those XP computers go back to 1904 when the clock dies. Yeah, because I went to even to the I went into the BIOS uh, setup, <clears throat> and the uh, time is correct. Oh, it is. All right. Okay, I, then you, that's not that's not the problem. Uh, let me see. Somebody in the Discord says they've got <laughs> they've got you know they got an answer. I'm looking, I'm looking. No, no, they don't have an answer. All right, never mind. <laughs> uh, you know, when you call me, you're not just calling me all by myself. We've got two different chat rooms running. Team tech guys in there trying to answer the question. There's Googling and stuff. We've also, of course, got of course. the you know hundreds of thousands of people listening to the radio show. So often uh, the answer will be <laughs> will be provided by the uh, the team. Uh, right now they're not uh, they're not <laughs> they're not being very helpful. Let me think. Why is the browser doing that? Which browser are you using? I'm, I've used uh, let's see, uh, Internet Explorer. I use uh, Chrome. Uh, You're using IE7, right? IE7? I'm not sure. Let me take I think, a look. I think that was the last version. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, you know, I mean, look, this is probably part and parcel of, of the entire thing being out of date and broken. Um, browsers, no browser to my knowledge works with XP, is up to date with XP. So well, this, uh, this browser is uh, Internet Explorer six. Six. Oh. Yep. Oh man. <laughs> they won't allow me to go up there and download the. Oh beta. man, you're really uh, you're living on the edge, my friend. <laughs> yeah, you are living on the edge. Um, so that browser has known flaws. Tell me you don't just browse the internet random and willy-nilly. You're going to just one spot. You're going to get the latest download for your software to find radio or something, right? Yes. Okay. Always. But you're not going anywhere else. Nope. Okay. And then you got to hope that this site you're going to does not itself get hacked. Because what happens, bad guys get into websites. You know, there's lots of ways to do that. Because it's already in the mm -hmm. public, right? And then they put uh, what they call exploit kits on the website. It'll be thing, and you can buy these online, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. You download these exploit kits, and it has in this little blob, which you then put on the web server for that site, uh, hundreds of little scripts looking for flaws in anybody who visits. So the first thing they're going to do is say, hey, is this Internet Explorer 6? And you're going to say, yes, it is. And they're going to say, Oh, I've got something for you. And they're going to take <laughs> over your computer. Now, they, the good laugh. news is, and we were talking about this on our uh, Security Now uh, podcast this week with Steve Gibson. There is a point where something is so old that nobody's trying to exploit it. It's like anybody's using this has no money anyway. So we're not going to bother trying to steal anything from you. There's no, I don't, as far as I know, for instance, you probably don't have to worry about ransomware on Windows XP. Because they figure, yep. why bother, right? Really? So you're probably all right. I don't know why the browser's complaining. Let me see if I can find a browser, any browser that still works with Windows XP. You really shouldn't be using IE6. That was horrifically... In fact, many sites you go to won't work very well. See, best thing to do, see if that place where you download the files for your SDF... SDR offers FTP or something like that. Something a little safer. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let me let me just best or only browser for Windows XP. Let's see if anybody still makes uh, anything for Windows XP. I know Firefox, Chrome. Uh, what browser will run an XP? Pale Moon. <laughs> Believe it or not, I even have a couple other uh, uh, browsers on here, which, like uh, Lunar Lunascape. Yeah. Tried that one. Yeah, these are all people trying to do browsers that'll still work. 
So Opera, yeah. apparently Opera is which is a pretty good browser, still works. And you don't need much. You're 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 literally only going to this site where you get the software for the radio. Right. Nothing I else. Uh, Opera two, so I got the same message. Same message. Yep. I wonder if your certificates are out of date. What does the message say exactly? That the time is wrong? It says Private connection oh. can't establish between yes. the computer date and time is incorrect. Yes. It has a, a message below that that says N-E-T-E-R cert date. Yeah, this is a cert problem. All right, now I understand it. So okay. this is because your browsers are so out of date, they don't have up-to-date certificate information for, this, for the certificate authorities. So... Okay. As long as you're sure, that when you see the time on your taskbar, you see that time and date is correct, right? Correct. Yeah. What it's telling you is is that I can't establish a certificate with a site you're trying to visit because the certificates on your system are out of date. It's giving you a kind of, I think, an incorrect message. It's not that your clock is wrong. That can happen, by the way. That's why I asked you if your okay. clock was wrong. If your clock says you're in 1904, you'll get the same message because the certificate is authorized for certain, you know, a certain one-year period, which does not include okay. 1904. So the, you'll get a <laughs> kind of a generic error message saying, well, you're your clock is wrong. But but really, it isn't that your clock is wrong. It's that you don't have up-to-date certificates. They come with the browser. Um, go to opera.com and download the latest version of Opera. Okay. That will have a brand new set of certificates. So ha when's the last time you updated a browser or downloaded a browser? Uh, for this machine, maybe about couple of months. Oh, well, you should have gotten the new uh, certs when, when you did that. Um, oh. I have an uh, opera here now, and it still says the same thing, too. Yeah. The latest opera. Same thing. Yeah, I think they're just trying to tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is bizarre. Isn't That's it? That's bizarre. Well, it isn't, because honestly... What you're using is, at this point, it's a horse and buggy. And so, yeah. uh, now, are you sure that this, is it, does this only happen when you launch the browser, or does it only happen when you go to the site? Uh, only when I launch the browsers. Okay, so as soon as you launch the browser, it uh, gives you that message that the time is wrong. Okay, so this is maybe the root certificates in the operating system are so old. How how could we update your root certificates? Really? Yeah. Let me just see. Update root certificates. <laughs> XP. <laughs> Another thing too is I got to mention is if I put if I put in an actual. Look well, uh, I have to run. We're out of time. I'm sorry, but we're going to keep working on this. Leo Laporte playing a little blues for poor old Don and Carson, who wants to use ancient browsers, ancient operating systems. He still likes DOS 3.0, and for some reason those browsers just don't like the modern Internet. They say your clock is wrong. I think what they're trying to say, Don, is <laughs> you're living in the past. I think you need to update. Probably the best thing to do at this point, Don, for your safety uh, and to solve this problem. We, By the way, I spent another three or four minutes with him off the air trying to solve it, is to just put Linux on that old machine. You'll get an up-to-date operating system with up-to-date certificates and an up-to-date browser. You won't have the security flaws. And the real trick is to make sure that you can download and install those software-defined radios, which is apparently the only thing you're doing with this old machine. And I am sure there is a ham out there who will help you do that. So really, we got to get you on a more modern operating system. You know, this ties into the question we had earlier with somebody with old HP printers. He had just recycled because Windows 11 and Windows 10 didn't have drivers anymore. HP wasn't make drivers. And it, it is, to some degree, it is, it is kind of artificial obsolescence. 
it's these companies saying, look, I mean, Microsoft can't be expected to support every version of every operating system it's put out over the last 40 years. You just, that would be a, an unreasonable expense. It's, it's, it's not something we've really had much experience with, right? <laughs> In the old days, you got a horse. The horse worked until it didn't. <laughs> Then you got a new horse. But there was no question of, I'm sorry, your horse is too old for the bridles we sell today. The saddles we make in 1883 don't fit the horse that you bought in 1862. We don't have that problem. We didn't, anyway. But we do in digital technologies, unfortunately. And it's because all of this software, if you're going to continue, you, you don't have to sell it anymore, but if you're going to continue to support it, that means you have to dedicate full-time engineers to fixing bugs, solving bugs, doing security assay, assays to make sure there's no problems. And companies just aren't willing to do that. So, unfortunately, I mean, the computer you're using, there's nothing really wrong with it, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, it still works. The problem really isn't the computer. It's the software you're running on it is antiquated, is out of date. That horse doesn't fit that saddle. So you have two choices. One, get a new computer, get a new horse. Or the other, go back and get some saddles. They're a little weird. They're odd, but they still fit the old horses, and we call it Linux. And 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 just put Linux on there, and then you can... Uh, get it up to date because Linux will continue to support that just as Linux would continue to support those old HP printers. There is a Linux that will run on that XP computer. It doesn't have a lot of RAM probably. It's going to have to be a, a version of Linux designed for old machines, but, but there's somebody out there making that. And you, you put that on there, it'll run and it'll have an up-to-date browser. It'll have up-to-date certificates. You won't get this error and you'll be secure, which is my most significant concern. You don't want to ride an old horse with a new saddle. That's all I'm saying. 8888 Ask Leo Steve on the line from Corona, California. Hi, Steve. Hi, Leo. I had a question for you, and I know sort of know your feelings about antiviruses, but I have 90-year-old grandparents that are sort of on training wheels when it comes to computers. Yeah, so, some, always... so while you don't need an antivirus and I don't need an antivirus, there are definitely people who need antivirus. Okay, that's what I sort of wanted to know. Yeah. I've always had the ESET on their computer before. ESET's everything. good. It's very lightweight. The thing I would say, though, is this is part of my concern about antiviruses. They are now, not now, oh, you're safe. The antivirus mm -hmm. is not 100% protection. It's not even 50% protection. I mean, it's better than nothing. Windows comes with an antivirus that is just as good as ESET. So if they're using Windows, they have an antivirus. But if you want a little extra protection, it's not a bad idea to put ESET on there. Now, um, do those two run congruent with each other? Or yes. In the past? They work yeah. fine, yeah. Yeah, usually you don't want to have two antiviruses on there. But because Windows now has this built-in defender, uh, all the antiviruses intended for Windows will coexist. They may, they may I'm not sure what ESET does, it may disable Defender. But I'll give you an example. We have editors uh, down the hall doing the video editing for my podcast network. They were running on Windows 8.1 until recently. We've just bought them new computers. <laughs> but they were using 8.1. And because they were using an old version of Windows, they were running ESET. Um, okay. So I am not against that at all, especially for people, teenagers, seniors, uh, people who are just don't, naive about computing. The, the last guy we just talked to, <laughs> he should be running on antivirus. Um, you know, people want to run insecure versions of the operating system. It's not the yeah, end of the... I know my, I know my grandparents, if, if, like, if they get an email from one of my family members and they say their email got hacked, they're going to click any link that came from an uh, email that looks familiar. Exactly. And they're in their 90s. You cannot blame them. No. I don't blame them at all. My mom's 88. Uh, you know, honestly, I would... Let's see, can't do this either. I would not let my mom use Windows at this point. Uh, but, you know, they're familiar with it. I, if You, you know, a better bet would be for them to be using a Chromebook, which would probably do everything they want and would not be, you know, subject to malware. Mm -hmm. they could, in fact, yeah, if you're on a Chromebook, you can click that link in the email and nothing will happen because it is expecting Windows. Okay. But, you know, but they're, you know... As you get older, I know, you get stuck in your ways. Change is scary. 
change is scary. Uh, it's it's worth a try because it's not going to look so different. It's Chrome, you know, so it's a browser basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably they're living in the browser as it is. I doubt very much they're doing anything outside the browser. No, it's mostly in the browser. Yeah. Another good one. My mom loves her iPad. The only downside on an iPad for older users is eyesight. It's a small screen. Yeah. Even the biggest iPad is only 12.9 inches. So, But you can get a Chrome box with a big screen or you get a you know Chrome laptop with a big screen. Uh, that'll be easier for them to read. They can put You can make the text big on that. But if they're, you know, if they're stuck in the Windows world, which is a shame. I mean, honestly, this is this is where the computing industry went very wrong. Normal people should not be using a general purpose operating system like Windows. It's just requires too much uh, caution and skill. But if they're insisting yeah. on using Windows, put ESIT on there. That's fine. Okay. Thank you, Leo. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I know. <laughs> Look, we have to live in the world, right? Best best solution, uh, they, and they make them. There are computers they make for seniors. Basically, they're like Chromebooks. I think that's the easiest way not to get a special, expensive computer. But the computers designed for seniors are same thing, very limited. Keeps them out of trouble. They can't do much with it. Windows, you can do anything. That's the problem. And, of course, that's why we love it. Because, you know, if you want to do anything... <laughs> that your little heart desires with your computer, you want a general purpose operating system. It's what I want. But then if if you say that, you're taking on your, and this is the problem, People, there's a disconnect between the, the desire for this general purpose operating system and the responsibilities it entails, which includes becoming a security expert, becoming your own IT department. So unless you're willing to be your, you know, a, an expert in internet security, which is a full-time job for most people, unless you're willing to be your own IT department, it's probably a bad idea to get Windows. Unless you know, I need to do, you know, this weird thing that I can only do in Windows. Okay, fine, but now you've got to be a security expert. You you know, cuz it's cuz it's risky. It's risky. We can't you can't have both. You you know, you can't have a general purpose, powerful operating system and not learn how to use it. That's why, you know, Chrome OS is very popular. It's popular with schools. They don't have to worry about malware. Popular with people who just don't want to be computer geeks. iPads, same thing. Uh, the only problem with iPads, and my mom loves her iPad and she's able to use it, is uh, it's a little hard to read that small screen. 8888 Ask Leo. Uh, we're going to take a little break. News at the top of the hour. Come back with more of your calls. So give me a ring. Let's talk tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the nerdle. All right, John, let's see here. Let's check the board. Make this a little bigger. Okay. So here is our nurdle. We know we've got a three, five, a seven. Uh, the five is here. We got an equal sign, of course, and we've got a times. Do does that mean we have two fives if we see a red and a green? Oh, okay. That that red isn't meaning that five. Okay. So. We, and we, we're pretty sure, unless it's an equal over way over here, which it could be. Could be. Let's not rule that out. Yeah, we have to because we have too many numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So we know the equals here. The five is here. We've got to come up with something that equals five. Some multiplication number that has one, two, three, four, five digits. So three and two digits. And... Some of the digits are three, five, and seven. And the answer, I should be able to solve it here, I think. Honestly, right? We don't have a one, two, four, six. We could have an eight or a nine. We don't know about eight and nine. Three, five, seven. Eight and nine are possibles. Is zero one of them? Uh, yeah, zero's in there too. Okay. So it's sometimes something that's going to equal five. Three digits times four digits. How can that be? 
That's that's not possible, John. That equals five? Must be a division in there. No, I understand. But no multiplication with three digits and two digits is going to give you the answer five. There's got to be a division in there. Well, can we do something like three times five divided by... You already know the answer. You sh oh, you already know the answer. Okay, so you can give me a hint. There are not two. There are not two operators in there. There have to be. Yes, could be a subtraction as well. So let's see. So I'm going to do. John says my clue is my multiply is in the correct place. What? I know, I know, I know, I know. I can't leave it, though. 8 times 9 is 72. Minus. Nope, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Divided by. That's not going to work. Yeah, I know. I need to, I need to use uh, 5, 3, and 7. So... Nine times fifty three is four hundred seventy seven <laughs> uh, divided by no, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. But I'm in the I'm in the right ballpark here. So oh I know what I'm gonna do. I could do times five no, no, it's got to be a it's got to be divisible by five, I think, unless the multiply could be subtraction, which opens it up a little bit. John's giving me all the good clues. I give up. It's making my head hurt, John. My head hurts. My head hurts. Uh, 5 times 73 divided by <laughs> 5 times 7 divided by, no, minus, 5 times 7 is 35. 35 minus, huh? How do you get 5 out of 35? You divide by 7. Minus 30. Minus 3, 0 equals 5. Is that what you're telling me? Let's try it. Let's try it. I won! Woohoo! That with a lot of help. Ah, with a lot of help. A lot of help. That's pretty funny. So tomorrow we won't we won't spoil it for you. <laughs> Lisa's very good with numbers. She should be uh, she should be superb. English wasn't your goodest subject either, was it, Chicken Head? Chicken Head's the king. Uh, well, mashed potatoes pretty good too. <laughs> Uh, it makes sense, though, if you have a creative chat handle that you'd be good at show titles. That makes sense. What is that? Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number, if you want to talk high tech. Let's do it. What, what do you say? You and me. Part of the high tech army, 8888 Ask Leo. There are really, uh, I think there are two kinds of people in the world uh, people who love tech and people who can't 
abide by it, can't understand it, hate it, don't know why it works, don't want to have anything to do with it. So this is more a show for the former. But if you hate tech, but you still need to use it, this might be of value to you as well. 8888-ASK-LEO. When I used to uh, do uh, a show for Tech TV, when I first started in 1998 on Tech TV, um, I was already doing this show, the radio show. So they knew I could do, I could talk for at least three hours on any subject having to do with tech. So uh, we, we proposed a show called The Screen Savers that was a call-in TV show, just like this, but on TV. Uh, but they had a problem. They had 24 hours to fill and they didn't have any budget. So they said, Leo, we know you can do three hours on the radio. Could you do two shows? And I said, yeah, I'll do another show. It'll be called Call for Help. But Leo, that's the same show, they said. People calling in and asking questions. And I said, no, but no, it isn't because they'll have two different audiences. Call for Help will be a show for people who came to technology because they had to, because they were using it at work, for instance. And they had to understand how Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel work, used, uh, was worked. And, and they didn't care for it particularly, but they had to use it. That's who Call for Help was. The, the kind of utilitarian, here's how you use technology. The screensavers was for people who fell in love with technology at a young age. And I'm, I'm one of those people. That often it's through video games or early programming with basics, something like that. Uh, and who just love it, who are enthusiasts. So that's what we did. We did two different shows, one for enthusiasts and one for people who maybe don't have any passion for technology but still have to understand it. I only get one show. I only get one show here. So this is for both of you. 8888 Ask Leo. All the information we talk about will go up on the website after the show, techguylabs.com, including audio and video from the show and a transcript. Uh, but meanwhile, let's get back to the phones. David is on the line from Venice Beach, California. Hi, David. Hello, Leo. Thanks for picking my call. Welcome. The last time we had somebody calling from Venice Beach, he uh, I got into a fight <laughs> with somebody. Wait, no way! You were okay. That was not me. But when I called you last, I think it was three weeks ago. Yeah, or two weeks ago, you told me the same thing. Oh, okay. So it, it wasn't the last time. You were the last time. So I just wanted to warn you: keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> you I'm never know what's going to happen on Venice Beach. Okay, David, what can I do All for right. you? <laughs> I'm most likely the one doing the fighting because I'm the big guy here. I'm, I'm really big. Oh, you're safe then. Anyway. Good. <laughs> I am. But um, but I'm not safe with my computer so much. Since no. I, um, yeah. My buddy um, fixed a computer for me. I mean, he put a computer together for me. Nice. And I want to connect my Canon XL2 camera to it yep. using a um, display port. That's on my computer. Display oh, you want Canon. video from your Canon. Yes, sir. Ah, so you're going to stream or something? Yeah, I want to record my old um, mini DV cassettes and put them on digital. Right. Yo, yo, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's funny because that's the, uh, now that you say it, that's the camera we used when we first started streaming. Uh, uh, our Twit network was Canon XL2s. Right. We had three or four of them, right, John? And pointed at me. So uh, those are a little out of date now. They're maybe closer to 20 years old. But uh, you have a lot of mini DV cassettes that you shot with it. Certainly do. Yeah. Now I'm trying to remember. I think it has, does it have FireWire out? Yes. It does. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So you need to get FireWire into your computer, which, of course, no longer has FireWire. <laughs> Bingo. I tried that. So I tried the second option is to go through the RCA. And have a converter. Oh, don't do that. Because you want to keep it digital if you can. Because then, if you do that, so the camera, the D, the mini DVs it's recording are digital. Mini, mini yeah. digital video. So if you do that, then you're having the camera convert it to analog. Converting it back into digital for the computer, you're adding a, a, a step that degrades the video. What you want to do Ooh. is firewire to Thunderbolt. Okay, Wow, I heard about that and I neglected it. Do you now? What computer are you using? Um, many many modern computers will have Thunderbolt, but sometimes older computers, your your guy built you one. It's a Windows PC, I'm going to presume. Correct. Yeah, it, it depends on what he what he, what motherboard he uses and stuff. But you certainly will have USB yeah. Thunderbolt. 
looks like it's a type c adapter so it doesn't look like it's the square usb type a adapter it looks like how do i describe that it looks like a little rounded slot it's rounded on both okay. ends if you have that uh then you just have to get the right cable the the reason you want to do that is it stays digital Going right from the DV cassette right into the the computer. You don't you don't have that degradation of converting it twice. Oh, but you've got it. But the trick is going to get get the right adapter. So what you're going to need to do maybe find it out for your buddy who built you this, or did he give you the manuals when you got it? Uh, yes, I have that on the side. Okay, so the manuals will tell you what ports that computer has. It's probably going to be in the motherboard manual. So look, it's a it's a it's a tower case. Yes. Okay. So he may have put some additional cards in there for other connectivity, maybe video. Um, they'll have their own manuals, but chances are any Thunderbolt will be on the motherboard. If it only has USB, there is. I th let me see if there's Thunderbolt to USB three would probably work. So you need to get a. You, in other words, you need to get the cable that matches what what you've got. So I'm sorry, FireWire to USB three. Yeah, there are FireWire to USB three cables. Twenty nine dollars on Amazon. Well, that's not bad. Yeah. So actually, even less depends on what you've got. So uh, you're going to find out what's on that motherboard. Worst case, you can go out and you could buy a FireWire adapter for your. PC, put it in one of the slots, or more useful to you going forward, a Thunderbolt adapter, because Thunderbolt's really fast, 10 gigabits per second, up to 40 gigabits a second. So that's nice, because the faster it is, the you know, you can connect it to hard drives, other video devices, and so forth. So you're probably, I mean, you're going to do this project once and then sell the cameras. They're not, or unless you continue to, <laughs> right? Or are you going to keep right. using them? Yeah. I don't need it. I, I don't you don't need them. They're out of date. Yeah. yeah. So you could you could install, and I don't think a FireWire card is very expensive. You'd get a FireWire PCI card. But the first thing to do is see what capabilities you already have. I see. Let me see what a and let me see what a FireWire to PCI card would cost because it's probably pretty cheap now. I have FireWire the old-fashioned way. It looks like. Um, a rectangle but rounded on top with three or four pins. Yeah, that's 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 the, that's the standard firewire. I can't remember on those cameras if it's firewire four hundred or eight hundred. That doesn't really matter because yeah, so a four port PCI firewire adapter card is forty bucks. So it's not expensive if you and if you have a slot open still on your motherboard, that that might be a pretty easy way to do it. So first thing, check the motherboard manual, see if you've got Thunderbolt. Or FireWire, something that you can convert FireWire into. If you don't, you can add FireWire ports to your computer with a FireWire card. It goes right in the slot, and those are cheap. Oh well, I have the old one for my old computer. When when I used to use the Canon XL2 with my old did it have computer. a did it have a, a card removable card? Yes, but it doesn't fit inside my computer. I don't know much what I'm talking about. But I know I <laughs> is your buddy still around that built it for you? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. No, don't worry about it. When you open up the computer, you sh if there's yeah. free slots, you'll see these square things that you could put something in. Probably the standard from your old computer to your new one is different. So maybe that's the problem. That Those new okay. slots are called PCI slots. PCI slots. And, you know, but again, the first thing to do is see if you already have some something that you can convert it to. Although 40 bucks might be cheaper than a firewire to the USB cable. So it might, it, might be, it might be just as easy to do that. So you put a card in. Uh, in fact, the chat room's given me a link to an Amazon uh, page with uh, exactly the right kind of uh, cards. And uh, it'll work with both kinds of uh, uh, Thunderbolt 1394A, the Sony kind, uh, the Canon kind, and then the Apple kind. So, and this is twenty bucks. Okay, now, now you got to do it. <laughs> Thank you, chat room. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you chat room. Wow. Hey, have fun. What's on those videos? Uh, a document, fifteen or sixteen years of documenting Muscle Beach. Oh man, you got you got a you got a movie there. Uh, yeah, I'm producing a documentary. Yeah, yeah. Do you got Arnold in there? 
I cannot confirm nor deny. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Now you got something, and I. And the beauty of this is you can make that documentary, but you don't have to get a company to buy it and show it at Sundance. You can put it on YouTube. I, I have my ego. I want to put it at Sundance and put it in the <laughs> Okay, for it'll be good. It'll be good. You yeah. can call it Pumping yeah. Iron 3, the Venice Beach story. It'll be great. I'm looking forward to it. Actually, it's, the <laughs> it's called the original Muscle Beach. The original Muscle Beach. You know what? I would buy that. I'd love to see that. It's, Your wife wasn't there for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We went, we've we gone down there. She likes to do the uh, the monkey swings, you know, those rings that you swing along. But uh, they last time I was down there, they really up. Created Muscle Beach. They've got some a nice gym equipment there now. It's pretty Indeed, pretty nice. Well. So people still yeah. still uh, lift there and do... more than ever. And they don't lift. But we do. We lift each other. We do acrobatics. Like we lift people. Up. I've we seen that slack there. line and all sorts of interesting acrobatics out there. It's fun. I love Venice it's Beach. Fun. Yeah. Fun. Oh, I'm glad you have that documentary. I'm glad you have the tapes. Yeah. Let's get those converted now. Absolutely, David. Get to work on it. Any help I can any help I can give you, you call back. Oh, thanks. Okay, but look behind you. So when you say you're big, are you a weightlifter? Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I lift people up and myself. <laughs> could, how, what's the what's the biggest person you could lift? Um, I can lift like four people at least. That's the thing. Um, what? If, 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 yeah, it's like you could like, bench press six hundred pounds, man. No, 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 no. I cannot bench press, but I can put on my knees and my shoulders. Oh, yeah, you hold them. Physics. Yeah, you hold them like that. Yeah, like an acrobatic trick. Oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. Shane, I'm going to come down. I'm going to come down. I know Muscle Beach is reopening. I'm going to come down. I'm going to visit. Please do. And look for Soup. That's my nickname, S-O-O-P. Soup. Super Superman, because I body doubled Superman in the movies. You I did? Look. Which Superman? Yeah. The first one, Man of Steel. Oh, man, you're ripped. Dude, uh, yeah. No wonder you don't worry if somebody's coming up from behind. <laughs> Nobody's coming up on soup. Soup is all alone. It's nice to meet you, soup. Have a great day. Oh, Leo, it's pleasure. Take care, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty. You see, we meet all kinds here. I love it. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Speaking of all kinds, spaceman Rod Pyle coming up in fifteen. You stay right here. He does this, right? You kind of, you bend your knees. You got two people on your knees. <laughs> it sounds like fun. I'm making friends everywhere I go, Rod. I want him to put us on his shoulders. Then, you know, he ain't going to do that. And two other people. <laughs> That's why I asked. Can you because hold, how much can you hold, Soup? The shoulder I'm on will be the one that's kind of sloping down, right? <laughs> you'll, you'll be barely counterbalancing the other side. Hey, I'm so glad you guys talked about Firewire, because I have probably, geez, seven years when I was working in DV between uh, the end of Betacam and the beginning of True HD. Oh, so you have and, a lot of those tapes? Oh, maybe a thousand. You want to see? Just you want to see decaying, soup? Decaying, you know. By the way, Kim has found yeah. Soup's website. <laughs> That's the man we were Whoa. talking to. Whoa! He oh, body doubled Superman. Looks like he <laughs> is Sparta. Wow! I like the uh, the Horus head the best. That's how. That's what I want my look to be down at Venice Beach. I am raw the with third. the eagle head. Uh, Charismatic the masculine presence. Look at that! And oh, look at that extended leg. Up in the in, oh, the in the left I'm scared there. Scared of this guy. <whistles> Woo! Uh, that's definitely somebody you want to be friendly. I'm going to go down to Venice Beach <laughs> and I'm going to say, "Soup, you hey, You're going to have your, your your private bodyguard down there. Look at this which guy. Which you sometimes need at Venice, depending on the day. You know. I tell you what, I'm not introducing my wife. <laughs> uh, that's it. I'll she be so gone. She does oh, the, there he is. The, Look at see, he is doing the the, the oh, six yeah. people thing. Oh, that, that's a physics problem right there. It, that's what he said. He says it's just physics. Yeah, that's like the Hadron Collider in, in, uh, in Neat. <laughs> so Lisa does the uh, the swinging rings? She does the like, rings like the these. Yeah, she's really good. Yeah. Oh, man. She can go all the way there and back. She's really good. She's wow. super fit. That's why I'm saying I'm not introducing him to Lisa. <laughs> be it on my marriage all Impressive. over. Yeah, yeah, I used to be married. Then soup came along. <laughs> it was all over. That isn't going to happen. You no know soup it. for you, Lisa.
<laughs> so, uh, what do you want to talk about today, Mr. Pyle? I want to talk about a cry for help to the aliens. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. I it's can't wait. It's a really weird, weird but cool story. Okay. All right. We will talk soon. I'll be here. S double O P. Short for Superman, because he body doubled for Man of Steel. I'm telling you, we got celebrities listening. Kim, you want to go down and uh, do an interview? We could do a documentary. You could do it. Let me go see some. Soup. I think you'd like to <laughs> like to go down and cover that story. I just can I just touch the abs? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's amazing. Holy oh, cow! But you know what? He was sounding like it's funny. If I would never put that that caller no, to this picture. No, I mean, he sounded like his sweetheart. Yeah, I, well, I I was... I'm sure he is. You know, that's one thing about big guys. They don't have to be scary, right? <laughs> Look at Aunt Pruitt, sweetest guy you'd ever meet. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't have to prove anything. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed... With shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. No, not me, them. 8888, ask Leo. Get ready. You got your cup of coffee in hand. It's time for Super Chris from Miami, our coffee achiever. Hello, Chris. How are you, my friend? I'm working the microphone, so I'm not going to scream because I know I can see you. I'm leaning back like just a little bit. <laughs> How many cups of coffee have you had today? Well, I'm going to be honest. Uh, I'm in about four and a half. Kim's in about one and a half. And I'm in, we now, do we count? What do we count? Uh, a little cappuccino as you know about a half a demi tasse a half cup. How much is that a half? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm on one and a half in. You are. Yeah. One mug and one demi tasse in. So what can I do for my friend from Miami? Well, let's ask the first question, and that is, well, first, thank you so much, very much, always for taking the call. Always uh, a pleasure. Thank you, Chris. The, and um, Amy Webb. Have you read the book? I only got as far as chapter five. I, uh, I, because I interviewed Amy, her new book is called The Genesis Machine. It's a fact, yeah. Our quest to rewrite life in the age of synthetic biology. And it's there a, it is. yeah. Oh, I have it. It's a great book. I know. Yeah. Uh, I gave my first copy to John. John, did you read it yet? <laughs> Our studio manager is a, a sci fi fan. It kind of is sci fi, some of it, but it, it really is about the next big revolution. Which I've been saying is coming for about 20 years. You know, we, we're in the midst of the information revolution, the digital revolution, uh, obviously. The, the, the thing, you know, the computers and the Internet changed so many things. But her position is we are getting very close to being able to gene edit, to gene splice, to create new genes and to modify our children before they are born to be disease-free, to have superpowers. What are we going to do with this ability? And uh, to answer your question, I haven't read the whole thing cover to cover, but I've skimmed most yeah, of it. Me neither. Yeah. Yeah. But well, you enjoyed it, right? Well, here's the problem. Um, I made it till about, I did all of the first chap, and then all of a sudden I got into the, well, part two. So you've uh, probably been uh, drinking too much coffee to read this book. Nope. You need to, well, you need to cut it into small coffee. pieces and digest it. Uh, you know what I would recommend if you if you haven't finished it, uh, there are a couple of couple of sections I would read. The nine risks are good, and especially well, the chapter eight, the story of golden rice, is I think a very interesting story. And then there's a whole chapter of predictions of what the world might look like. Actually, it's a series of chapters, and that's more like sci fi. Sci fi. So there's scenarios, and those scenarios. Uh, I think start in uh, chapter 10. So go skip, you stopped at five, skip six, seven, and eight, go right to nine, and I think you'll get the, uh, you'll get the uh, momentum well, back. It's not that 
that I stopped at five on purpose, but one of my business partners came over and he's like, I got to read that book. And I Oh, said, he okay, stole it from you. <laughs> yeah, so I ordered another one. Good. In the meantime, I've been reading The Science of Getting Rich, of course, by Wallace D. Waddles, and then I'm, I'm rereading Steve Jobs. So How's that I working have, for you, by the way, The Science of Getting Rich? Is it working? It, it does work if you apply. Like, you know, the thing is a lot of times, and, they, and, and a lot of people will say, you know, about Leo Laporte and, and, you know, how you've done in your life and your career started. You know what? And, and I remember one. I never did this to make money. Uh, there has been, incidentally, I've made some money. I'm not rich, but I'm well off. And that, But that's completely incidental. I did this because I loved it. In fact, sure. everybody told me, don't get into radio. <laughs> that, is not a, that is not a path to to wealth and fame and fortune, that's a path to driving a 10-year-old Subaru uh, and working in Idaho. But uh, I've been very lucky, thanks thanks to the Premier Radio Network, our syndicator, and uh, my wonderful mentor uh, at KFI Radio, Robin Bertolucci. I have been very successful. Thank you. Hold on, Chris. Taking a break. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I did not get rich writing 13 books <laughs> that was a sure path to poverty um but i am glad amy webb wrote this because it is really uh i a think it, it's well it's more than good although it is good it's reading amazing. it's important because yeah. i think this this is something we are going to have to deal with and uh i think it's very interesting yeah it is. sorry eric i wasn't talking about you i would have honestly Driving a 10-year-old Subaru living in Idaho is not bad. It's not a bad life. It's not. Uh, sometimes I, I wish I had chosen that path. Let's put it that way. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. That resets everything. I know. Like no, you know what? You know what? Wow. All I, I wanted enough money to do a few things. Send my kids to college yeah. so they didn't have a crippling debt when they got out of college. Yeah. I feel really good that I was able to do that. Uh, not that they're using these college educations in any way important, but at least they had the chance. So that was one. And then I wanted to have enough money so that when it came time to retire, I wouldn't have to live on Alpo. And I have and I have achieved that now. So um, that's all I really wanted. D Dana Carvey said it. He said, getting rich and famous just means you have a bigger bedroom to watch TV in. Mm. And I think that that's kind of true. Oh, yeah. Okay, you're right. I can I can go on cruises. I can. I get to travel. But I didn't, it would have been okay if I hadn't had enough money to do that. But I do have enough money to do that. So that's fine. I don't know if I'll be buying a Lucid Air. It's $130,000. But <laughs> I can dream. A boy can dream. Yes, yes. Chris, did you have a question? Because I have to go for uh, Mr. Rod Pyle. Oh, you're having a uh, Mac crisis, it says here. Yeah, I don't know which one to get, but you know what? I can always, you know, Rod is, I talk to Rod sometimes. He's calling in from Mars because he's got that great view, and I'm trying to get you into space, and we don't know how to do it, but Rod's amazing. But I can always I can always write you an email if that's okay. And get sure. You, you know the email. Yeah, day. I'll look for I, it. I do know it. Yeah, I'll look for it. it so. All right, Chris. All right. Yeah, I'll All talk right, to you there. You too, My pleasure. Always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Leo. Take care. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Pyle. Are you are you are you are you on the launch pad? So you you've gone and told me that writing books won't make you rich. You've completely Shh. destroyed my. Do plan you know that? It. Isn't but well, wait a minute. You know better. How many books have you written? Uh, well, if you count everything, I just finished twenty, and you're Jeez. absolutely right. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I'm just saying. So, what's your? If you took the money you made on those twenty books and divided mm. it by the number of hours that you spent writing those books, what would your hourly wage be uh, you know every now and then i do that and it it usually is above minimum wage which, okay. which is good okay as it's more is, than 725 an hour i'm glad yeah, to hear it yeah yeah so we're pretty happy but it's even above california minimum no wage. if you're that's, making it's really good you know i would say it'd be worthwhile if you were making like 50 to 100 bucks an hour yeah probably it's because there's other benefits you get notoriety you get to be on radio yeah. shows and stuff like that well and that's the thing you know and and so if people you know sometimes people come asking for book advice or coaching or something and the trick is 
you know, you're. It's like you said about radio. You do it because you love it and because you have to, and because you couldn't find another way to make a living that, that yes. thrilled you as much. Yes. But the speaking circuit is where it's at. Oh, there's big money in that. Because a couple hours of that oh, is there's... like an entire book advance. You yeah. know. No, there's you do it right. I oh man, it's good, good money. It's kind of stunning. Yeah. yeah. It, the last two years have not been kind, but you know. Yeah, we'll not bad. a lot of speaking going on. No, uh, a little bit of virtual stuff. I did do one thing. I did a, a keynote at the uh, IBM Watson IoT conference. Oh, fun! Like, oh, Justice cool. Twenty Twenty was starting when oh, that's this all cool. came out, and they did like pay us to do it virtually, which shocked me because I thought, that, oh, that's the end of that. But uh, not a lot after that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, spaceman! Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Let me get my stack. Let me set my timer. Oh. He's got a timer. <laughs> I'm big time now, man. Fancy. <laughs> uh, four of the 30 books. Yeah, you don't have to show them all. <laughs> it's time for our spaceman, Rod Pyle. He's the editor in chief of. The National Space Society magazine at Astra. You can get a copy of that at space.nss.org. And he writes about space a lot. You just told me 30 books? Wow. 20. 20. 20. Okay. Still, more but than me. Open for 30 by the end of the, by the, end of the line. You know? Yeah. No, I, I, wrote, I wrote 13 wrote and I decided to stop at the lucky number 13. <laughs> uh, because I realized I was making less than minimum wage. Yeah, so it was those royalty checks that were under a dollar that did it, yeah. right? <laughs> Amazing stories of the space age, interplanetary robots, blueprint for a battle star, first Yay. on the moon, some great books, among the 20. He joins us every week to talk about the latest in space. You know, we really timed this well. It's been an exciting time for space exploration, hasn't it? I mean, things are just happening. It it has and continues to be, but today we're we're taking a little bit of a sideways step about we're going to talk about aliens cuz we haven't talked about aliens for a while. So well, they live in space, that's fair. Well, that's true, and and I call this one a cry for help to ET. So They live I should correct myself. They live in space and on Venice Beach. <laughs> And in your closet. And I have a few under my thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Do we know? Well, first of all, when you say aliens, you're not talking about UFOs. That's something no, else. No, not at all. Al yeah. You're talking about the idea that life may exist on other planets. Other planets, other star systems. And an alien could be intelligent life, but it also could be a paramecium. I mean, right? That would be an alien. Right, right. So so in our solar system, you know, whether you're talking about Mars or Enceladus or Europa, you're probably talking about microbes and, and maybe maybe some, some multicellular creatures, but, but nothing substantial. But this particular story is about a project coming up for World Space Week in October this year. A group called METI, which is an offshoot of SETI. So SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. METI is messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. Oh. METI, which is active SETI, which worries some people because they're afraid of telling the aliens we're here, is going to send out a message to the TRAPPIST-1 star system in October. And it's going to say a number of things, but among them is, hey, we've kind of messed up our planet. We're in a little bit of trouble. What do you <laughs> hey, think? you got an extra planet? <laughs> yeah. Well, or wow. do you have advice for us? Uh, so you're saying that this new message to space is a cry for help? Well, kind of. I mean, it's really that more does of an seem like a thing. bad idea. It's an information. So how far well, away? How far away is this pl is this planetary system? You you could also call it ringing the dinner bell. It's um <laughs> thirty nine light years from Earth. So so, so the minimum it's a seventy nine to eighty year round yeah, trip. Yeah. So so yeah. we won't hear back from them for thirty nine oh, wow. years times two at if if right. if it even gets it. So. I, but I think what would be interesting, by the way, because it's 39 light years, the chance of them coming to us is low unless they've somehow invented faster than light travel. Right. If they could do a, a wormhole shortcut, they may step right into your studio. That's sci-fi. But yeah. maybe more reasonable to say, well, at least we could have a, a very slow but a very maybe profitable conversation. Right. So we're starting the message with a signal to let them know it's artificial, so it's not just some repeating pulsar or something. Yeah. 
Uh, then there's a digitized periodic table oh. to establish some ground rules. Like, yep, okay, yep. we got the same physics here you yep, have yep, you know, where yep, you are. Yep. And then uh, there's a little bit more stuff of mathematics. And then there's... Stuff we cultural. think would be universal everywhere in the galaxy. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like what we did with the Voyager records, right? Right. right. And then there's... So this is a group of anthropologists, historians, sociologists, and artists and scientists. Uh oh, so we got artists in there. So there's going to be <laughs> no, thank should. goodness that's the best of us. Yes. So they're going to send music, and I, oh. as I gather, a lot of the information about hey, we're we're kind of uh, you burn the candles at both end here on Earth is in this music, which interestingly, uh, it, it, there's a number of compositions, but it includes some stuff from a Uzbeki group. So it really is truly you know, a universal kind it's of global. representing the planet. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. When we sent the Voyager record out, was there any music yeah. on that? Oh, yeah, there was a lot. I think there was... Uh, there was natural sounds, surf, wind, yeah. thunder, and animals. Uh, there were spoken samples, greetings in 55 ancient and modern languages. Mm -hmm. um, and Carl Sagan's six-year-old son, Nick. Of course. Uh, uh, and then there was, uh, there was, I think there was some little Richard and a bunch of other stuff on there. So. Little blind Willie Johnson, Mozart, uh, yeah, Beethoven, yeah, yeah. Stravinsky, Mozart, Beethoven, right? Yeah. Blind Willie Johnson. Now Stravinsky, John, Chuck Berry. see, uh, for anybody who's into classical music, I would have worried about sending aliens Stravinsky because that might just cause them to attack. It depends on which piece <laughs> they did. It was the Rite of Spring. Beautiful. They're on their way now. Oh, you're on. kidding. No, come no. on, man. Yeah, well, I mean, caused a riot at the Paris. <laughs> Humpback whales. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're yeah. probably not Parisians out there. <laughs> I think you're <laughs> well, safe. That. So, so this is going to go out from a radio telescope in Australia at a place called, called I think I'm pronouncing this right, Goonhilly. Yeah. And part of the idea of behind sending to Trappist One, which was the first system that the um, that that particular uh, telescope identified, the Trappist instrument, is that that star system is 7.6 billion years old. Our solar system is about four and a half billion years old. So they'd be but ahead the of us. Is, they might be yeah, more sophisticated. Yeah, they're older than us, so they're either way smarter, they've wiped themselves out already, in which case... Or, but bad. they may send a message back saying, yeah, we had the same problem, the secret is in... The Eat less sugar. Yeah, that's right. Or something. <laughs> no, butter so. is good for you. Or as they yeah, said on Saturday Night Live, well, wouldn't that be great? Send more Chuck Berry. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be okay with me. So there are some some experts weighing in on this, though, saying you know, so SETI is listening, METI is sending, right? Yeah. So you know, I get kind of excited about the idea of trying to communicate, but but besides the you know, I say tongue in cheek about ringing the dinner bell, come eat us for lunch. There are some people saying you know, this is kind of like unauthorized interstellar diplomacy. Yeah, because so who like, are these guys? I mean, this they don't represent yeah. the Earth. This was the plot of a science fiction trilogy called The Three Built Body Problem. Right. And it was a, it's a fascinating conundrum. Should we that announce our book. presence? It was a weird yeah. Should we announce our presence <laughs> to the universe? Isn't that a risky right. thing to do? Well, and these and, guys and are just do doing, it? doing it. Right? Well, these, I mean, and these guys are just doing it. They, right. It's not like they asked us. I mean, it's like, are you going to walk next door to your neighbor in Petaluma and say, hey, call that guy in North Korea and tell yeah. him to stop messing with yeah. those missiles? You know, you want somebody who does that for a living probably to but do that. I understand their point of view is, well, we're scientists. This is what scientific exploration is. This is right. what you do is, you know, um, it could all end in tears. I guess that's the point. <laughs> or, or a bloodbath, but we'll hope not. So... And one of the things that makes Trappist interesting, so they're doing this twice. They're doing it once to Trappist and another to a, uh, another star system uh, a few weeks later called K218. But Trappist was kind of a big deal when they spotted it a few years ago. I think it was 2017 because it's got seven what we think are rocky planets. And a lot of this is by inference. You know, we won't be able to get better better knowledge of it until we've got the web looking that direction. It's the first target for the web, by the way. But it's got seven rocky planets, and we think three or four of them are in that habitable zone. So maybe they got water, maybe they got liquid water, maybe they got critters. So we'll see. Yeah. What's your position on all this? Should we just stay mum, or should we reach out? Reach to the stars? Uh, it's too late, right? I mean, how long have you been on the air? <laughs> 39 years. There you you've reached Trappist One, right? <laughs> no, that's true. My first my first outreach to the aliens was in 1976. Right. So you the, you make an excellent I mean, point. 
We got but, the Titanic but, SOS signals going out in 1912. You but, know? but don't those, I mean, over 39 light years, probably those signals have attenuated to nothing. Right. Well, but these are smart aliens. They've been around twice. Do you as long think? I mean, is almost. there just a little tiny, tiny photon still going, or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. Because we pick up uh, stuff from all over the universe, so I, wow. I think there's a very good chance they're, that they they're watching. They I, love right yeah. I love Lucy right now. I love Lucy, and they're looking at that conveyor belt with the chocolates right now, thinking, they "Okay, want, these people are right for invasion. send Let's more go. Vita Vita Vegemin." <laughs> Leo there Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was you're right. That wasn't Vegemite. That was Vita 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 Vegemin. Although there is a Marmite crisis looming. Yeah, yeah. Big Marmite shortage. Oh no. Yes, <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, these are the things I watch CNN, and they're talking about the war in Ukraine, but they're missing the big stories. What about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp? What about the big Marmite shortage? These are things inquiring minds want to know. But did you subscribe to CNN streaming service to try and keep <laughs> No, alive? I did not. No, I don't think you did. <laughs> I did not. Either. Because there was story. no news on it. This is where they went wrong. Everybody assumed, oh, it's going to be streaming CNN. But it's yeah. not. It's crappy shows that nobody wants to watch. So what kind of stuff was on there? Because I was listening to you guys talking about that this week. On it was, was all it, uh, it was all uh, sh you know this week in tech. I think uh, CNN has a lot of movies, you know, documentary yeah. movies. So it was a lot of that. And then they had shows. Chris Wallace, they hired him away from Fox, and so right. But it but it was it was all going to be kind of chat shows, not news shows. Oh. Yeah. So well, that's see, soft programming they do. It was yeah, soft no, programming. And the reason it's a, a thought is that they, they didn't want a cable companies to be mad at them. Because mm. they still make the bulk of the money. This is the innovator's dilemma. They still make the bulk of their money yeah. from, from cable. So when and, when... and, you know, I mean, cable broke their deal with me when they said, hey, if you pay us, we won't show commercials. Oops, that didn't turn out to be true, did it? Right. I mean that was really Netflix wants to happen all over again. Netflix is going to bring in commercials. I heard you guys talking about that. Not going to watch it if it's got commercials. The whole well, purpose of Netflix is to avoid commercials. And it was bad enough when commercials drove broadcast TV, but at least those shows were made to host commercials with the protagonist looking off camera with that long stare as they faded out of act two. Now they just drop them in like somebody dropped a knife on the thing, right? <laughs> and the commercial just comes banging Boom. in there in the middle of an emotional scene and they go, whoa. Boom. We just had the kiss moment and now we're watching a Muslim my favorite. So that was weird. My favorite moment when I'm watching shows on Netflix or yeah. I pay for at commercial free Hulu or uh, Peacock is that part where they have the dramatic ta -ta -ta -tum. And they fade to black, and they fade right back up to scene. Right. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's just to me, it's a commercials I didn't see. Meanwhile, but it is weird. Let's go to commercials, break, isn't it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you gotta go. No, no, no. I don't have to go. Well, I do, oh, okay. but I don't have to right away. Um, but isn't it weird having the five act structure go away? I'm yeah. still not quite used to it. I I don't miss it at all. I think they still. I think mm, they still do it. They just don't have a commercial to to signal. You know, if you haven't watched Slow Horses on Apple uh, TV Plus, I haven't. High, if you have Apple TV Plus, highly recommend it. Uh, this is my kind of TV, and and I bet you do because you probably watched For All Mankind. Uh, I did. Yeah. So Slow Horses is a is a British spy show. Mm. Uh, really wonderful and. Uh, the final episode is Friday, so you can binge the whole damn thing if you wait till Thursday. So I see somebody's mentioning on the chat Avi Loeb. He's the uh, astronomer at Harvard that got so much attention when Oumuamua oh, yeah. slung through the solar system a few years ago. And yeah. he finally wrote a book about it, which is pretty interesting if you get a chance. Oh, I'll have to read it. And he, his logic is good. You know, there's still people that are kind of scratching their head over how somebody running the Harvard Astronomy Department would step out and talk about that. But that's what makes good science, right? Just taking chances. Well, Open-minded. So and really open-minded. Yeah. 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 There's no aliens, but good. I'm good, good on him. <laughs> hey, thank you, Rod. Thank you, sir. See ya. Take care. 
Thank you for letting me be your tech guy this week and every week. Thanks to Professor Laura, our musical director. She spins the discs for us and makes us smile with her musical selections. Thanks to Kim Schaffer. She's the one who answers the phone, gets you on the air. Most of all, though, thanks to you, both who listen and call. Because, uh, well, it would be silly for me to sit here talking to myself the whole time. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. 8888-ASK-LEO. Time for a couple more calls before we wrap it up. Richard on the line from Paducah, Kentucky. Hello, Richard. Hey, Leo. This is Richard, obviously. Hello, Richard. I have a Synology, <laughs> have a Synology 4 bay uh, NAS with the two SSDs. Very nice. And I find it's, it's Synology. I find information on the 4 bays, but not really on the SSD. Any recommendation? On size for those? Uh, it doesn't need to be big. Those SSDs, so the Synology is a network-attached storage, and when you buy it, all you're really getting is an enclosure, in your case, an enclosure that can hold four drives, spinning drives typically, but you could put SSDs in there. I don't. I think it's probably not necessary. Uh, the Synologies are great. I recommend them. I have two of them. I, I love them. Uh, and th what happens is you put software on there that it's essentially a form of Linux. It's customized for that and you can do a variety of things most people at least use them for backup but there's other things you can do it can be a server in your house all sorts of stuff a lot of people use plex on a synology to make a media server the bottom of the synology has slots for one or two in many cases not all of them but have slots for one or two little uh, ssds and the whole purpose of those is to speed up primarily writes, but to some degree reads, of small files. So they're, they're basically cache. Uh, in co all of computer science, you'll see cache everywhere. The idea being, when you access some data, the chances are good you're going to want to access it again real soon now. So when you access data, whether it's a website you're visiting, uh, or in this case, uh, a file you're taking off the hard drive, chances are good you're going to want it again. So we're going to save that data somewhere faster than the internet or the spinning drives in case you ask for it again. And a good caching algorithm really speeds up your computing because it's going to predict, yeah, he's going to want this again, so let's keep it right here. So that's what those do. You don't have to have them on a Synology. The idea is primarily it's going to speed up reads and writes because if you're reading a file or writing a file, chances are, you know, you're going to do it again. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a not, I, you know what? I don't even know how much it speeds it up by. I always buy them. <laughs> I always buy them. Uh, you don't need a big one. 64 gigs is more than enough. You can get 32 gigs if you can find it. You certainly don't need 128 gigs because it's not going to ever use that much. It's a small cache kind of it, while you're reading and writing. So I'm sure Synology has a recommendation somewhere for what to get. It, but the nice they thing is all the charts, and I'm sure they do. I'm, yeah. I'm visually impaired, but I ah, do right. anything for the small ones a little bit. Well, let me see if I can find this for you. Cache SSD recommendations, recommended size. Let's see what they say. Um, this is on the knowledge base, Synology knowledge base. And the question is, what's the minimum recommended size for my SSD cache? They say the table below shows, so if your volume size is less than 24 terabytes, <laughs> which I'm sure it is, <laughs> yes, it will be. they say the minimum size of the SSD cache is 400 gigabytes. Wow, wow. Oh. Wow, wow. A terabyte or even a terabyte. Wow, ah, that's surprising. Um, yeah, not even a terabyte, 400 terabyte. gigabytes. So a terabyte would probably be better because... Well, it's more than I thought it was. It's larger. Yeah. yeah. They have something called the SSD Cache Advisor. So that's... Okay, I didn't get to that. That's part of their... Maybe I wasn't searching the right thing. Uh, it's not online. It's on your Synology. So it's oh, a... Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, you can I enable it, and what it does is it... Populated. Yeah, I didn't even know this existed. So before you buy the cash cards... Uh, before you lay down your cash, uh, run this thing, keep it running, and what it does is it watches what you do, and then, based on your behavior, it will then tell you. Oh, cool. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So that's probably going to be the most accurate. I'm actually surprised they recommend such a large amount of cash. I would have said much smaller, probably. 
Um, yeah, oh, that's surprising. Too. So they they to do the SSD cache analysis, they need at least seven days of data, uh, and yeah. then it will generate a result. So I would say don't buy it yet, and uh, run the advisor. I don't. I can't believe they say 400 gigabytes. That seems like way more than you would probably need. But yeah, yeah. hey, we're trusting Synology. They don't. They don't make money on that directly because you can use third-party caches. So. So also, I have a, one. A, I'm not a doctor, but I'm a patient. And your dry hack. You mentioned your medicines you take yesterday, and you said lisinopril. Yeah. For blood pressure. Yes, sir. Uh, I was allergic to that, and it caused oh. a dry hack for me. Goodness. Well, that's good to know. No, I think mine's allergies because I have been taking lisinopril for about five or six years now. So, and you've been hacking for about that, haven't you? Maybe. <laughs> it's either that or the Marlboros, one or the other. I'm going to, uh, I'll quit real soon now. No, I, yeah. yeah there, I'll see your doctor about that. I will ask him about that. Thank you for that suggestion. I appreciate You're that. Welcome. But see, we're helping each other. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. yeah. Have a great day. You're welcome, Leo. Shannon, Fort Collins, Colorado. Hello, Shannon. Hi there. How are you? I am well. Good. Um, question. I have a really old uh, MacBook Pro, and I've had it resuscitated once. And I feel like since it came back to me, while it is at least turning on, it got a little bit slow. Um, how old when you say very old? How old? I want to say 15 years old. Oh, my gosh. It's ancient. So Yeah, but let me tell you, it has, it has all of my Adobe suite on it, so I ah. can use it. Yeah, nowadays Adobe avoids that problem by not selling it to you outright. You have to subscribe, yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to do that. Exactly. I'm going to try to get them, get them put onto my other MacBook Pro that's newer. So um, there's a couple of things you can do. There's a couple of things you can do. First thing is you can get a program like Carbon Copy Cloner. That's one. Or Super Duper. That's another. That will take your internal drive and copy it bit for bit to an external drive which means all your adobe products will go with it and it will and they'll continue to work i would definitely start that with there a slow drive usually means it's the beginning of the end for that drive and slow drives are the number one cause of computer slowdown a uh, 15 year old hard drive it's probably on its last legs so the first thing to do is yeah well just go out to the big box store you can get a giant drive more than you'd ever need for under 100 bucks uh, okay. Plug it in, download Super Duper or Carbon Copy Cloner. You're going to have to get one that will work with your old version of uh, Mac OS. Um, I'm pretty sure both will have a version you can use. And what they do is they make an exact copy of your internal drive. Now, now you have an option. One way you could speed up that computer, and I'm not sure about these old MacBook Pros, how easy to get into they are, but you could put an SSD probably in there which would immensely speed things up. Even just replacing the hard drive would probably help. Okay. So, okay. But the first step is to absolutely now, before you go much farther, get a backup with Carbon Copy Cloner or Super Duper so that okay. if anything happens well, to that I internal drive, you at least have that. And by the way, then you can restore it to your new machine as well. Yes. So one of my, first, one of my main questions is, though, I did put a booster... Um, in no, the same room as no, that doesn't help. I feel like it almost slowed it up. Yeah, well, it's pro yeah, it's, it's it depends why it's slow. If it's slow because of the internet, maybe. But, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think it's slow because okay. of the hard drive. Yeah, it's the hard drive. Okay, thank you, Leo. Hey, a pleasure. Thank you, Shannon, and thanks to all of you for calling and for listening. I think it's time to wrap things up for this week, but I'll be back next week and we can talk about all of your problems with your technology next week or maybe something more uplifting. I don't know, space, aliens, <laughs> Chuck Berry. Uh, thank you for joining me. The website techguylabs.com has all the answers to all the questions. We'll have audio and video from the show up there in a couple of days as well as a complete transcript so you can search for the part of the show you want to hear again. Meantime, I'll see you next time. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, 
This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.